This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the do-it-all website that lets you make your own website. Seriously, take it from me. If you have your own brand or business or even just credentials that you'd like to fashion into a high-quality resume, then making a website should be something that you're seriously considering. And Squarespace is by far the easiest and most convenient way to build a website of your very own. And if you just thought in your head, yeah, that's cool, but I have no idea how to design a website, then one, I heard you, I can read your thoughts, and two, you don't have to worry about that one bit because Squarespace has a good gazillion templates for you to choose or work off of. And after you've got your beautiful .com, if you create online content, you can use Squarespace's fantastic member areas to gain and reward your supporters. Or host your own videos on your own platform. Or use your site to link all of your social media accounts together. Which is what I'm doing and why I now just feature my Squarespace website on my Twitter. So hey, if you've ever considered a website, check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you want to keep it, boom! Go to squarespace.com slash bandit for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You're welcome. And now, on to the video. You know what's kind of annoying? Having to go through multiple videos in order to get the full story behind something. Since we've already gotten through the boss lore of each and every 3D Zelda boss, which is crazy to think about, and inspired by my good friend Hyrule Gamer who just uploaded a similar type of compilation, I have decided to compile every boss lore video that I've made up until now into one giant convenient video for you to either watch the first time, the second time, or easily share with friends should the subject of Zelda lore ever come up. And uh, take it from me, if you have a friendship that discusses video game lore? That's a good friendship. You should keep it. Oh, and I have one favor to ask of you if you're listening to my voice right now and are able to leave a comment on the video. Let me know what video game or game franchise you'd like to see get the old boss and dungeon lore explanation treatment on the channel. I will be reviewing each suggestion carefully, and just so you know, I have full plans on covering the Metroid franchise soon. Anyway, there's not much more to say before delving into the video other than please consider liking the video if you like the bosses of The Legend of Zelda, and make sure you're subscribed if you're not already to stick around for more gaming lore. Oh, and spoiler alert for the entire series, obviously. A Zelda game without bosses is like rice without any curry. Like, yeah, you could just eat the rice, it might even taste good fried or with a little salt, but where's the doll? Where's the paneer? Where's the chicken tikka? The first genre or grouping of bosses we'll cover would be those that are the natural enemies of the game. What I mean by that is bosses or beings that may have not been affected by Demise's malice or Girahim's personality, or at least the ones that are not confirmed to have been affected. Speaking Speaking of enemies that aren't confirmed to be affected, there are a few bosses that fit this criteria that aren't really bosses, but do serve as mini bosses the first time they're encountered due to the fact that they are a bit tougher than your average Bokoblin, which is a trend that happens with these same enemies in a lot of Zelda games actually. First up is the Lizalfos, which is a monster that may or may not have been entirely created out of the evil power and malice of Demise, many years ago when he initially created his armies to battle against Hylia and the forces of light. The reason I say they may have been created by Demise is because Fi tells us directly that Demise is the source of all monsters. However, there are some monsters which I'll go over that didn't stem from Demise, so it's also possible that things like the Lizalfos are naturally occurring species in the land of Hyrule, but I digress. The next boss that may have not originated from Demise's power is the Moldorak, which is a giant, armor-clad, thousand-year-old scorpion monster with a large singular eye. Well, actually three eyes with two in its claws and one in the middle, which is reminiscent of Goma, which is another reappearing boss of the Zelda franchise that appears different each time, but every time being some sort of an arachnid monster that always features a singular main eye for Link to normally shoot at. The Moldorak is actually just an aged version of the much more abundant and much more tiny Araka monsters, which are very similar to just real life scorpions with one eye. We don't have any specific reason to believe these monsters were created by Demise, except for the fact that they disappear in a puff of purple smoke when they die, but you know, it, it could go either way. Next up is a boss that would actually be difficult to connect to Demise, and that is the 100% robotic, artificial life form known as the LD-002G Servo, or as I like to call him, Yarg, the Robot Pirate. Beep boop. Servo is a member of the ancient robot race encountered on the Sand Ship, which used to be just a regular ship before the sea became sand. Also, fun fact, the LD in all these robots' names stands for Lanayru Desert, which makes sense until you remember that when they were created, it was an ocean, not a desert. But we just won't dwell on that for too long. We actually 
know a little bit about Servo's backstory too. According to a single word from Fee, Fi. it's possible that Servo used to be a member of the crew of the ship, led by LD-301N Skipper, and that Servo then led a few other crew members in a mutiny against Skipper and his loyal crew. But I know what you're thinking, how could robots command a ship and even mutiny against each other? Where did they come from? Well, and this is just a theory of course, but in my opinion, the ancient robots were created by an ancient race of people that are closely associated with Hylia and Nehru and technology and also the color blue, you know, the Sheikah. We know they existed in the ancient times of Skyward Sword because Impa comes from the past. I think it's pretty plausible that the Sheikah were mining time shift stones in order to create the Gate of Time under order of the goddess Hylia, who is credited with the creation of the Gate of Time and also possibly being the goddess of time itself, but hey, that's a whole other theory. The time shift stones that are cut and processed even have an ancient version of the Sheikah eye symbol present on them. I think that the ancient robots were most likely created either by the Sheikah or by Hylia herself in order to assist in mining time shift stones. Perhaps even in order to find all of the powerful resource there is to find in the world before it can fall into the clutches of Demise. Because if Demise were to also harness the ability to travel through time at will, that could be problematic. This is why the ancient robots created ancient ships in the shipyard in order to travel far across the ancient sea and scour the region for time shift ore, led by one LD-301 model, in particular, Skipper. Then one day there was a sea squall and conveniently that was also the day that Servo decided to mutiny and take over this ship. There's also an improved version of the LD-002G Servo known as the LD-003D Dreadfuse, who appears much later in the game in the Sky Keep, which is a shifty dungeon created by Hylia in order to keep the Triforce hidden from the world, and also helps to prove that the ancient robots were in fact created by Hylia either directly or indirectly, since everything inside the Skykeep must have been placed there by Hylia as a test for the hero. This is also another reason to potentially believe that not all monsters were created by Demise, since there are Bacoblins and Moblins and Keys and others located inside the Keep, but anyway, moving on. The next boss in this section would be the underground crawling insects known as Moldorms that make multiple appearances in this game and in other games in the franchise. I personally believe that these monsters are just naturally occurring large insect wildlife that just so happens to be aggressive towards Link. Just like most of their other appearances, they're elongated, segmented, worm-like, centipede-like monsters that are clad in armor everywhere but for their tails. Except for in Twilight Princess when they're just little jumpy worms. The final boss for this first section of the video would be the infamously intimidating abyssal leviathan known as Tentalis. I had to research long and hard to get the backstory on this one, but I'm pretty sure you're gonna enjoy it. You see, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a little one-eyed monster known as Michael Wazowski. Over a long, painstaking ordeal, Mike was finally able to marry his longtime girlfriend, Celia May. Together, they had a child that shared characteristics from both of them and was born with a single eye and snake-like hair tendrils. Ahem. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, this boss out of pretty much every Zelda boss in the history of Zelda bosses is probably one of the worst designs for an abyssal Leviathan that I've ever seen. And yes, its design looks like something out of Monsters Incorporated. Eerily similar, in fact. Like, like seriously, does Disney know about this? Do they need to get involved? But appearances aside, there are a couple things that we can guess about its background, which otherwise is completely devoid of any and all details. See, when you actually face the giant tentacle monster, it's in the distant past, as proven by all the water around the boat. And also the fact that the boat doesn't look like a piece of garbage. And also, when you talk to your flying blue computer companion about Tentalis, she confirms that it was a tyrant of the ancient seas. Now, this is particularly interesting because we also know that where Tentalis is, a storm or sea squall is sure to follow, as proven by the storm or sea squall that we can see here while fighting it. And while we don't have any other confirmed records of an ancient sea monster plaguing anybody in the game, we do have a record of an ancient terrible sea squall that happened on the same day that the mutiny occurred aboard Skipper's ship. And personally, I don't find that a coincidence. So on the one hand, it could be that Demise or Girahim was responsible for creating Tentalis and making Tentalis make storms that led to mutinies. Or on the other hand, it could be that the fearsome pirate Servo and his scurvy robo crew found some way to call upon the Abyssal Leviathan to aid them in their quest for mutiny. I think I like that explanation better because it gives some mythological feel to Tentalis and makes the relationship between it and Servo seem kind of like the one between the Kraken and Davy Jones. What can I say? I love Pirates of the Caribbean and Tentalis is pretty Kraken-like, you've gotta admit. But whether 
Father Tantalus was simply a mysterious mythological monster of the deep from ancient times that was called upon by scurvy pirates, or it was created by demise is up to you to believe, of course. But one other detail I'll point out that could mean nothing but could also mean something is that Tantalus' English name, you know, Tantalus, is extremely similar to Tantalus, which is a Greek mythological figure, one of Zeus's many children that was famously punished by being made to stand in a pool of water that he could not drink out of with an apple hanging from a tree above him that he could not eat because it was just out of reach. That's actually where our modern word tantalize or tantalizing comes from. How that relates to Tantalus, I'm not sure, but do with that information what you will. Who knows, maybe Tantalus wasn't always an abyssal sea monster but was cursed into that form long ago as a punishment. Moving on to the next segment of the video, it's time to talk about the many bosses that were definitely created or influenced by the dark powers of Demise and Co. The most obvious ones would be the Stalthos enemies, or the more powerful Stal Master variants, which are of course risen undead skeletal monsters that were at one point warriors in life. They're also one of the only monsters in the entire franchise that has made an appearance in every Zelda game, I think. I I'm not sure I scripted that off the top of my head. Somebody watching fact check that for me, but I'm pretty sure they've been in every Zelda game. Anyway, their explanation is the same as always, which is that they are corpses quickened once more by demise. Next up, we've got the main boss Scaldera, the pyroclastic fiend from the Earth Temple. You know, that boulder looking living glob of lava that uses a bunch of rock as armor. Fortunately for us, we've got a pretty direct confirmation from Girahim himself that Scaldera was more than likely a demon created by Girahim. He knows about Scaldera, he even introduces Link to Scaldera, who he calls his friend. What a hospitable guy. I guess I'll have to refer to Scaldera as the pyroclastic friend from now on. Next up, we've got the one, the only, the terrifying ancient automaton Kaloktos, located deep within the ancient cistern. Now, besides Girahim or Demise himself, Kaloktos is undoubtedly one of the most recognizable bosses in all of Zelda history. I mean, just look at this thing. It's shiny, it's kind of creepy, it's got six arms and wee little legs. I mean, what's not to love? As its name insinuates, and in conjunction with the ancient cistern within which it is located, Kaloktos is in fact ancient. And given that it was an automaton that was ultimately tasked with guarding the chamber of the flame, I'm pretty sure Hylia, who apparently had a knack for making robots, was the one to create both the dungeon itself and Kaloktos. That being said, Kaloktos might have actually been a sentient machine once, much like the LD models if it weren't for Girahim's interference and the corruption of Demise's malice. That's right, you heard me, M-A-L-I-C-E, the same stuff that's swirling around in Breath of the Wild that goes by the name Calamity Ganon, y you may have heard of it. I mean, the pieces add up, it came from Girahim, which came from Demise, and it's a dark purple goopy substance that possesses and corrupts technology. And it's probably the same substance that's dropped by the cursed Bokoblins, which are also present in the dungeon, which is Monster Malice, referred to as an evil crystal when it crystallizes. Farron also states that the cistern used to not have any monsters inside, so this means that once Demise or maybe Girahim got word of Link obtaining the Goddess Sword, Girahim took it upon himself to leak Malice into the dungeon personally, but <laughs> what is this, a Lore of the Dungeons video? <laughs> No, no it's not, so we're gonna move on. Next up is the Dark Lizalfos, which just like their name sounds, are the dark versions of regular Lizalfos. These Dark Lizalfos are to Lizalfos what cursed Bokoblins are to Bokoblins. Well, kind of, because they don't look like zombies, but they can curse Link, just like cursed Bokoblin bites do. They don't drop evil crystals as loot, but the fact that other enemies in the game that can also inflict curse, like the cursed Bokoblins or Dark Keys, do drop evil crystals leads me to believe that the ability to curse, at least in Skyward Sword, comes directly from being possessed by Demise's malice as proven by the evil crystals. So in a nutshell, Dark Lizalfos are more than likely malice-tainted Lizalfos. Next up, but also in the same dungeon that the Dark Lizalfos are first encountered, are the multiple appearing lava hand monsters known as Magmanoses. And to be honest with you, there's literally nothing about their origins in the game. So logically, I feel that just like Girahim was able to create a living lava demon monster known known as Skaldera, the pyroclastic friend, he probably was also able to create these living lava demon hand monsters. Who knows, maybe Skaldera and the Magmanoses are not only a cool band name, but also the result of Malice being conjoined with the lava of Death Mountain, I mean Elden Volcano, something we may be seeing happen again in Tears of the Kingdom. And speaking of Malice, the final boss to cover before covering the big baddies themselves would be the easily forgettable Bylacite, which is the parasite responsible for corrupting Levius or Levius or however you pronounce his name, the wind 
skinned fish and also for causing his temporary insanity. Bilocyte is malice, plain and simple. Seriously, just look at this concept art for Levias. Dark reddish purple clouds, corruption, sentient eyeballs. Yeah, that literally fits the bill for exactly what malice is in Breath of the Wild. The only question I have is when did Levias get corrupted? If he stayed flying up above the cloud barrier, then he should have been largely unaffected by any of the badness happening on the surface, right? Well, as we see in the Leviathan Bones of Breath of the Wild and the ending cutscene for Link's Awakening, wind fishes can definitely descend down to the surface at will. And in Skyward Sword, we even see Levias flying back up to the sky from beneath the cloud barrier, and there's only one thing down there, the surface. So it's possible that Girahim started messing with the Thunderdome, turning it into a Thunderdome, and Levias then flew down to the surface to check out what the heck was going on, and subsequently got corrupted by Malice somehow. He never actually sheds light on what happened. The personally, I'm of the opinion that it was in fact Girahim's doing. Seriously, when in doubt, blame Demise's uber-powerful super demon running around the world with the express purpose of setting everything as out of order as possible. And what a masterful segue into talking about the fabulous boy himself in the final segment of this video. But right before we do explain Mr. Eyeshadow, I wanted to thank you for watching these videos. Seriously, I know it doesn't really matter to the vast majority watching right now, but it means a lot to me. If this isn't the first one of these videos of mine you've watched, or if you enjoy this one being your first one so far, by the way, hi, my name is Bandit, nice to meet you. I wanted to ask if you would be so kind as to consider subscribing to the channel. I know lots of you are either rolling your eyes or looking to fast forward the segment right now, and that's okay, but for those of you still listening, I just wanted you to know that for the first time, I'm beginning to feel like this channel could really grow. Like, really, really grow. Especially with this Lore of the Bosses series expanding into other franchises. And I can see that 80% of my viewers, or about 4 out of every 5 people watching my videos currently, are actually not subscribed to the channel. To put that into perspective, if that were flipped, and it was actually 80% of you that are subscribed, then this channel would literally be at over 1 million subscribers since starting the Lore of the Bosses series. Which is insane to think about, but anyway, I won't take up any more runtime talking about this. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and please consider subscribing to help grow the channel and flip that statistic to help get us to, let's say, 300,000? Dream big, right? And you can always unsubscribe later if I lose my touch. And now, back to Girahim. And really, it's kind of hard to explain Girahim's existence without also explaining demises, but in either case, let's start with what we know about Girahim. We know that he's a demon lord, being one of the most powerful versions of monsters in the entire franchise, who proclaims himself to be the lord of the surface, and that he was created by demise in order to be an extension of his will and carry on the battle against Hylia no matter how many years it might take, which is exactly parallel to Phi, Fee. who was created by Hylia in order to be an extension of her will and carry on the battle against demise no matter how many years that might take. But more on the parallelism between these two parties in just a bit. He's also very confident and driven and cunning, able to thwart even a wish of the Triforce, but none of that is crucial information. To be honest, Girahim really isn't that hard to explain. He was created by demise. He serves demise. Case closed. The real mystery is why is everything regarding Girahim and demise strangely exactly parallel to Hylia and her partner? Well, I'll tell you what I think, but forewarning, we are entering the major theory zone. Of course, you are as always welcome to believe whatever you personally would like to. I'd like to start off by saying that there are many different theories about how Demise came from Laurel and stuff like that, and it's all really good stuff. Ultimately, as far as I can tell, it comes down to the fact that Demise is said to have emerged from a fissure or crack within the Earth, and his Master Sword, aka Girahim in sword form, has an inverted Triforce symbol in the exact place where the Hylia Master Sword has an upright one. The fissure that he emerged from is similar to the fissures that connect Laurel and Hyrule in A Link Between Worlds, and the inverted Triforce symbol is seemingly the same as the inverted Triforce symbol also from Laurel, which was a land destroyed long ago. This theory insinuates that that might even be the entire reasoning for Demise invading Hyrule, so that he could have Hyrule's Triforce instead. Like I said, this is actually a really good theory and really great way of thinking, but it does leave a few things up to the imagination. For instance, it doesn't explain where Demise came from, as in literally where or rather who he came from. It also doesn't explain his intentions, as in why he wants a Triforce in the first place, or why he hates, you know, good. My theory will explain both. In the beginning, the goddesses created everything. Every ocean, every mountain, every creature, down to every last blade of grass. And this isn't debatable, this is canonical proven lore that even has its own cutscenes in Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess. And once the goddesses were finished with their creation, they left the world, and at the point of their departure, the Triforce was made. However, that was not all that was created. Now, I'd like to ask you something. Something that's very philosophical, but also a cold reality. Given that the world of Hyrule was created, that would mean that nothing existed 
before it, right? Meaning light and dark, heat and cold, up and down, and good and evil, and all these contrasting forces of the universe that give it form did not exist yet. When the world was created, all of these things came to fruition out of the creation of contrast, because in each case, one cannot exist without the other. Light was created, therefore dark was subsequently created as well. Heat was created, therefore cold was as well. Up was created, therefore down was as well. And good was created, therefore evil must have been created as well. And this is the crux of my theory. What if the concepts of good and evil, which must have been created along with the creation of everything, were actually literally manifested in the beings known as Hylia the goddess and Demise the demon? Twin deities of good and evil to govern the world and define life and progress. Think about it, where else would Demise have come from if not from the same origin of literally everything else in the universe? And given that everything that is good in the entire franchise somehow stems from Hylia, and everything that's evil in the entire franchise somehow stems from Demise, and both of these individuals are inexplicably all-powerful with permanent eternal effects on the world, wouldn't it make sense for both of them to literally be the embodiments of good and evil incarnate? I mean, the more you think about it, the more it actually makes sense. Everything about them is perfectly parallel to one another. Hylia defends the Triforce, Demise pursues it. Hylia created a Master Sword with a Triforce facing skyward, Demise created a Master Sword with a Triforce facing towards the Earth. Hylia exists at the edge of time, Demise has conquered time itself. Do you see a pattern? Because it's actually everywhere. And we know the goddesses themselves are morally neutral. I mean, they have to be, right? Plus, we've seen them time and time again make very morally gray choices, such as the repeated choosing of Ganondorf to host the Triforce of Power, or the flooding of Hyrule Plier or the flooding of Hyrule prior to Wind Waker, you know not everyone made it out alive of that one. Mountaintops are only so big. So in my opinion, this works perfectly because the goddesses themselves are outside of our ideologies of good and evil, because they created it. But okay, you're probably thinking right about now, yeah, that's logical and philosophical and everything, and it does explain exactly where Demise came from, but what about his rage? His hatred that never perishes? Where did that come from? And that is a great question, because seriously, what happened to Demise to make him so eternally hateful of the goddesses in Hylia? Well, here's a simple kind of paradoxical answer for you. What if he's simply self-aware? Demise isn't stupid. Actually, quite the opposite. He's brilliant and so masterful a tactician that he successfully plotted his own escape from his imprisoned form before he was even imprisoned by creating Girahim. So what if Demise is so hateful of the goddesses because he knows why they created him? And he didn't ask to be made. He didn't ask for this life of pain. And I know that's a really dark concept, but seriously, Seriously, what if you found out one day that you were created for the sole purpose of being the incarnation of evil in the world? You were never destined for a nice or good or happy ending unlike your twin Hylia. Instead, you had only bitterness and defeat to look forward to, as ordained by your creators. So you let your anger at your own existence overcome you and become your every thought, not knowing that in your blind rage and defiance of your creators and your twin, you were becoming exactly what they had intended you would become. Hatred itself. An eternal curse upon good, and a necessary force to drive life into death, into life, into death, into life again, all in an eternal cycle. Because without contrast, we don't have color. Without darkness, we don't have light. And without a necessary evil, we don't have good. And that is my explanation for why Demise, or more specifically, the bringer of Demise, as is his real name in Japanese, was created. A Zelda game without bosses is like a bowl of ramen with only oh. noodles. It's like, yeah, it's a bowl, those are ramen noodles, but where's the flavor? Where's the succulent meat? Where's those little swirly looking things that are sometimes making appearances in the bowl? Let's begin with the very first set of bosses in the game. Queen Goma, King Dodongo, and Baronade. All three of these bosses were the direct result of Ganondorf throwing a fit because nobody would give him the spiritual stones. First, he wanted the Kokiri Emerald from the Deku Tree, and when the Great Deku Tree refused, Ganondorf cursed it with a literal giant spider monster known as the armored parasite Goma in order to sap the tree of its power and literally kill it, which he succeeds at actually. Now Ganondorf himself is a powerful sorcerer, capable of performing great acts of dark magic. So this means that Goma originated from one of two places. Either one, Goma was created out of thin air by Ganondorf to curse and sap the Deku Tree, or two, Ganondorf used his dark powers to evolve a normal spider into the humongous monster Goma. Although this 
this doesn't really matter much in the grand scheme of things and can be left up to personal interpretation because the end result is the same. Next up, we have the boss of Dodongo's cavern, King Dodongo. Similarly to Goma, King Dodongo was heavily implied to be the result of a curse from Ganondorf. According to the leader of the Gorons, Darunia, Ganondorf also asked him for the Goron's ruby but was once again denied the spiritual stone, prompting the Desert King to fill the cavern with, quote, ancient creatures and seal it shut with a giant boulder in the entrance, preventing the Gorons from accessing the finger licking good rocks inside. Now, given that Dodongo's cavern had no Dodongos in it before Ganondorf's curse, and given that these ancient creatures that Darunia is talking about are in fact the Dodongos and King Dodongo himself, this means that Dodongo's cavern once had Dodongos in it, hence its name, possibly even one as big as the skull present in the dungeon. But they were all cleared out long ago by ancient Gorons, or rather by an ancient heroic Goron in particular, but more on that later. This means that Ganondorf must have resurrected the Dodongos from their ancient tombs and by extension King Dodongo himself with dark magic in order to punish the Gorons for not giving him the stone. King Dodongo had a short second lifespan though. Next, we have the Anemonemonemone Baronade, which was responsible for putting Jabu Jabu in such a bad mood. Once again, this seems to be the direct result of Ganondorf's curse since King Zora confirms that Jabu Jabu was different and sickly following Ganondorf's visit. The Gerudo likely asked about the spiritual stone and was given an unsatisfying answer, since the stone was actually in possession of the Zora princess, Ruto. And similarly to Goma, Baronade leached the life of Jabu Jabu parasitically and might have even killed Jabu Jabu if it wasn't for the big fish literally swallowing the hero of time. Points to Link for being a more effective painkiller than ibuprofen. Now it's time to grow up. After Link turns into an adult, seven years have passed and once again, Ganondorf has been running around setting bosses in places they shouldn't be. This is again true of the first, second, and third temples which feature Phantom Ganon, Volvagia the Dragon, and the water tentacle monster Morpha. Phantom Ganon was an apparition created by Ganondorf for the purposes of stopping Link from saving Saria from the Curse of the Forest Temple, which awakened her as a sage. However, it should be noted that Ganondorf knowingly made his doppelganger ghost a bit less powerful than he himself is, possibly because he knew from the get-go that he would need to let Link live in order to come into the castle himself and reveal the Triforce of Courage, but that's speculative. Volvagia was another case of the dead being brought back to life by the hand of Ganondorf, and like I mentioned earlier, Volvagia himself was actually slain long ago by a Goron hero using the fabled Megaton Hammer according to Link. Uh, not this Link, the Goron named after Link known as Link. Anyway, Volvagia was a dragon that lived inside Death Mountain as its protector spirit and is even said to be the ancestor of Velu, the protector spirit of Dragon Roost Mountain. Allegedly, he was always rather aggressive and as such, the ancient Goron hero saw fit to smash him to smithereens with a giant hammer. And once Ganondorf became ruler of the land, he decided he would make a spectacle of the Gorons and feed them one by one as snacks to the freshly revived Volvagia in order to scare the other Hyrulean races into obedience. Of course, Link has something to say about this. The final boss that Ganondorf is solely responsible for creating would be the very strange aquatic amoeba Morpha, which Ganondorf placed inside the Water Temple in order to both free Zora's domain and its inhabitants and drain Lake Hylia of its water. Whenever given an explicit reason as to why Ganondorf so royally screwed over the Zora people, but it can be assumed that it was in order to halt the progress of the Water Sage's awakening. Now with Ganondorf's many creations out of the way, let's move on to the bosses that have their own reason for being, you know, bosses. Back in the Forest Temple, there's a group of Poe sisters that haunts the area known as the Poe sisters. These ghostly girls don't have an explained backstory present anywhere in the game, but it can be assumed that their spirits have been bound to the Forest Temple for quite some time, since there are portraits of the ghosts located within its castle-like walls. It's also interesting to note that each of the girls, Joe, Beth, Amy, and Meg, are named after the four sisters from the novel Little Women. This implies that they weren't created as Poes, but were once actually living people. And since Poes are heavily implied to be evil spirits regardless of their once peaceful natures who are tethered to the living world because of some unresolved attachment, we can also assume that the girls were probably all murdered in this temple before their natural deaths, and may have actually been friendly when they were alive. Next up, let's take a look at the infamous mini-boss of the Water Temple, Dark Link. Dark Link is without a doubt probably the most popular Zelda enemy other than Ganondorf himself, and for good reason. Evil doppelganger types are always popular enemies across all kinds of media, since it's a great question that Navi also raises in the game. How exactly are you supposed to conquer yourself? Is that even possible from a philosophical standpoint? Regardless, I'd like to point out that one thing that people confuse a lot is the identity of Dark Link shown here with that of Link's shadow from A Link to the Past, or the Shadow Links from other games. Simply put, those other inverted Link enemies that look similar are actually completely different in both their origins and their purposes. 
sources. Now keep in mind that there are many different Dark Link origin theories out there for Ocarina of Time, some of which are very good that you are more than welcome to believe if you so desire. But I'm going to explain what I think his origin story is from a very realistic and somewhat boring point of view which will differ from several of those theories. This Dark Link in Ocarina of Time, which is where the name Dark Link comes from, was most likely placed here indirectly by whoever made the temple in the first place. See, the Water Temple was created as a place where the Zora could worship the water spirits, but it's also clear that it was designed to be a trial as well. What? Trials? In Zelda games? Unheard of. But it's true, because unlike the other temples where it's more or less about Link finding his way to the end of whatever structure he's in, the Water Temple specifically shows you the end right off the bat, and instead requires intelligent manipulation of water levels and going back and forth between its many rooms and hidden compartments in order to solve its grand puzzle and access the final area just outside of your reach. And perhaps the solution of the temple is in and of itself how the Zora worship the water spirits. That being said, this also means that the room in which we face Dark Link was created as part of this big trial, along with the room's mechanics. This room is illusory. It creates false images that make you think it has no walls and that the floor is covered by a very reflective surface of water. Emphasis on reflective, which is the point of this particular trial. It's my interpretation that the purpose of this room is to test the worshipper traversing through the water temple with a challenge of conquering the reflective darkness within themselves, in order to purify themselves for the water spirits. After all, Navi doesn't imply that Dark Link is its own entity, like she does with every other monster in the game. If anything, she acts like Dark Link is just an extension of Link himself. And since Dark Link appears to originate from the tree in the middle of the room and reflects Link's appearance and moveset, it's my personal interpretation that the fruit of the tree, if you will, is a watery reflection of the individual who would brave the trials of the temple in order to seek purification from its waters. This is why Dark Link exists and is a boss, at least in Ocarina of Time. Number next, we have the mini boss of the Shadow Temple and boss of the area beneath the well and subject of many nightmares, the Dead Hand. Now previously, the Dead Hand and the Shadow Temple itself were hugely speculated over, but ever since the release of the Hyrule Encyclopedia, we've gotten a confirmed answer as to where the spooky temple came from. It was built as a place for the Sheikah to capture and torture the enemies of the royal family, which would explain the, you know, torture devices and cages. It marks such a dark and bloody time for the history of Hyrule that the royal family is actually forbidden to even speak of it. Of course, there are many other mysteries present in the temple, but that's another video for another day. Dead Hand's presence in this old Sheikah temple can only be due to one of two things. Either one, the Dead Hand is the result of dark Sheikah experiments in order to create some sort of hungry, undead, man-eating monster with which to feed their subjects to to get rid of them after they were done torturing them for information, explaining the Dead Hand chamber and many human bones present in it, or two, the Dead Hand was supernaturally created from the aforementioned many corpses that lie in the Shadow Temple walls when the dark power of Bongo Bongo was released and added to the temple, cursing it and giving rise to the undead within. This would explain why the Dead Hand initially pops up underneath the well, and its dead appearance with the bleach white blood-stained skin and its human skull head. It would also explain the ability for Dead Hand to summon infinite numbers of hands to grab hold of its victims with. Though, I personally favor the first explanation due to the fact that there are two Dead Hands in the game, implying pretty heavily that they were purposefully created and placed in Sheikah torture chambers. And speaking of the Shadow Temple, its final boss, Bongo Bongo, is also shrouded in mystery. For those who don't know, Bongo Bongo is an evil spirit whose appearance is similar to that of a hanging beheaded man, with a giant eye in its neck and cut off hands that just can't help but play the drums. Bongo Bongo was sealed within the well by the Sheikah leader, Impa, but broke out when the darkness grew too powerful. And this is most likely because of the rise of Ganondorf's power, since he is in fact the leader of the forces of evil. Where Bongo Bongo came from initially though is again widely speculated over, but I have a more realistic take on its origin. Many people assume that the man whose house used to be located where the well sits now is the real identity of Bongo Bongo. And this may or may not be true. One thing's for certain though, and that is that Bongo Bongo is a spirit. A big spirit. Not to be overly simplistic, but we do see what spirits of the dead look like as far as size is concerned in the game. They're pose, and they almost always end up being smaller or thinner than the average human. But in some cases, we come across pose that are far bigger than the others called 
big pose. And one of the biggest pose in particular is the boss named Jalhala from The Wind Waker. Jalhala is so massive because he's composed of other smaller pose. So here's the question. What if Bongo Bongo, the evil shadow spirit, is such a massive entity because he's composed of the spirits of many dead people? And you know where a bunch of dead people were made? In the middle of Kakariko, under the well, and within the shadow temple, conveniently where Bongo Bongo originated from. My personal interpretation is that the dead hands killed so many people that their combined lingering hateful spirits manifested as the phantom shower the phantom shadow beast Bongo Bongo, whose hands were cut off due to the spirits of the dead being shackled in life, and whose head was cut off to signify their executions. Moving on to the next temple, the spirit temple dedicated to the sand goddess, located within the Gerudo Desert. Also the hideout for Ganondorf and his followers before he rose to power and moved to the floating Hyrule Castle. The mini-bosses of the temple are the Iron Knuckles, which have a pretty simple explanation. They're brainwashed Gerudo women in suits of heavy armor swinging massive weapons. And honestly, I don't have a problem believing believing that they could physically do that because have you seen their biceps? But the bigger question is who is responsible for brainwashing these poor women? Well, that would be the boss slash bosses of the temple, the twin witch sisters known separately as Kotake and Koume, or together as Twin Rova. According to the lore, Twin Rova is Ganondorf's surrogate mother slash mothers. And since there's actually two of them and they're sisters, I personally feel like the term surrogate mother used here actually means more like adoptive mothers rather than the other meaning of a surrogate mother, which includes a woman birthing a child for another woman who can't. That being said, it makes sense then that Twin Rova would be such a devout follower of Ganondorf. They're just proud to see their little boy grow up to be the evil king he was always meant to be. What a cutie. They're also both over 400 years old and apparently go to heaven when they die. Huh, they must have helped other old ladies across the street when they were alive. The final boss of this game is none other than Ganondorf himself, who transforms into Ganon after his initial defeat. Most people know Ganondorf's backstory even if they have haven't played Ocarina of Time, but I'll go over it anyway. Ganondorf was the last known male Gerudo born to the Gerudo race that's historically been entirely female. Well, mostly female. It was said that once every hundred years, a boy would be born, and that boy would be the Gerudo King, which is why Ganondorf is the last Gerudo King. However, since he kind of tried to end the world, ever since Ganondorf's defeat at the end of Ocarina of Time, and Wind Waker, and Twilight Princess, and A Link to the Past, the Gerudo women have completely sworn off men, even those of their own race, and as such, they are now, for all intents and purposes, entirely composed of women. If there have been male Gerudo born since the time of Ganondorf, it has been undocumented and unconfirmed, and they have been banished from their own homeland, which is why their existence these days is a theory. A believable theory, but a theory nonetheless. But back to Ganondorf. In Wind Waker, we're able to get a better understanding of why Ganondorf did what he did in regards to overthrowing the Hylian royal family. He was jealous. The Gerudo Desert is a harsh environment, and ultimately as the Gerudo King, he wanted the lands or winds of Hyrule to be the new home for his people, which seems noble, but he absolutely went about it the wrong way and somewhere along the way lost sight of his democratic ambitions and instead began to covet the ultimate power known as the Triforce in order to subjugate the entire world to his will, forcefully. Initially, Ganondorf swears allegiance to the King of Hyrule in order to craftily locate the Triforce for himself, but Zelda sees through his lies and asks Link to help her with getting rid of the man with the evil eyes. Since, you know, you can't count on the King of Hyrule to do something like that. After Link and Zelda open the door of time to find the Master Sword and thus the entrance to the Sacred Realm, Ganondorf actually predicted that they would do this, and gains free access to the Triforce within the Sacred Realm and attempts to take it for himself. However, due to the imbalance within his own heart, the Triforce splits into its three separate pieces of power, wisdom, and courage, each then residing within Ganondorf, Zelda, and Link respectively as they represented those individual attributes the most. After this happened, Ganondorf wanted to find the other two pieces to reform the completed Triforce Force and thus regain ultimate power. But with Zelda being in hiding and Link fast asleep for seven years, he had to come up with another plan in order to locate the missing pieces. And just like Ganondorf had Link do his work for him seven years ago, once again, Link located Zelda and her Triforce of Wisdom and brought the Triforce of Courage himself directly to Ganondorf without the Gerudo Usurper ever having to leave his throne room, which he predicted again. Of course, Link is able to defeat Ganondorf, which he did not predict.
Benedict, who tries to bring the castle down on top of Lincoln Zelda in another attempt to kill them. When this fails, Ganondorf, who I guess was still not dead, calls upon the Triforce of Power to transform into the pig-like monster known as Ganon, who lives for about 40 seconds since the Hero of Time with the Blade of Evil's Bane was standing like two feet away and proceeds to kill Ganon immediately, who then reverts back to Ganondorf, who then becomes sealed away temporarily, but for the remainder of this game. Simply put, Ganon is the demonic form that Ganondorf transforms into that embodies his lust for power. And as far as the timeline's concerned, this is the very moment that Ganon was created. Who, just as a reminder, we still haven't been able to rid the world of to this day. I personally believe that Ganon is the embodiment of the curse that Demise places upon Hylia back in the events of Skyward Sword, and that Ganondorf was able to access this power through the Triforce of Power, but that's just my personal headcanon. Ultimately, this is all kind of the goddess's fault, since they're the ones who decided to leave an all-powerful relic in the hands of mere mortals anyway, but alas, we are not destined to understand the whims of the gods. A Zelda game without bosses is like a box of chocolates that's empty. You never know what you're gonna get because there's nothing in there. The bosses in Majora's Mask can be pretty much all grouped into one of three umbrella categories. Bosses that were corrupted by the power of the four giant masks, bosses that are the four giant masks, and of course the big bad Majora itself. So let's start with the first category of bosses that have their own reasons or were corrupted and work our way up the ladder. The first bosses you encounter in the game besides the Skull Kid slash Majora's Mask themselves, which isn't really a boss fight, would be the two mini bosses of the Woodfall Temple, the first of which is a Dinalfoes. This is simply a monster that does appear multiple times in the game and across the franchise that's really more of a powerful species of monster than a notable boss. So really the explanation for it is the same as it would be for a Lizalfoes or an Eralfoes or even a Bacoblin. It serves the forces of darkness and somehow either found or created its own weapon and armor and wants nothing more than to make Link go to sleep in a permanent kind of way. The next mini boss of the Woodfall Temple is yet another repeating enemy in the game, the Gecko with two Ks. However, unlike the Dino Foes, the Gecko is actually not normally a bloodthirsty monster. It's actually a corrupted frog, which is otherwise harmless and kinda cute. Aww. When under the effects of corruption, the frog mutates into a more lizard-like form that walks on two legs and, you know, tries to kill Link. And both Geckos in the game, this one and the one that appears later on in the Great Bay Temple, show signs of intelligence in that the first one runs away from Link and primarily attacks by riding on top of a killer turtle monster called a Snapper, and the second one encases itself in mad jelly which acts like both a shield and a method of attacking Link. In either case, when defeated, the geckos don't die, but rather just devolve back to their original little frog body, so you don't have to feel too bad about it. As far as what dark power is responsible for corrupting them, though, why, it would be none other than Majora itself, or more specifically the corresponding giant mask, but more on that later. The next natural boss encountered would be the Wizro, which is again a repeating mini-boss that pops up in the Snowhead Temple, and then again in the Castle of Ikana, Stone Tower Temple, and the Secret Shrine. Most fans probably know that Wizro robes are not new enemies to the franchise. Far from it, actually, with their first appearance stemming from the first game and stretching to being included in 12 of the games in total. In each appearance, whiz robes are always an intelligent species of humanoid creatures that are very proficient in magic, but the curious thing about them is that they tend to switch up their appearance quite a bit, from being more human-looking in the original games to being birds or maybe even the Rito in The Wind Waker to being whatever the hell this is in Breath of the Wild. Kinda looks like Gru from Despicable Me. We're going to steal the moon! Regardless, the wizard robes in Majora's Mask are definitely more human looking, and of course are set out to make Link's life as hard as they can. They teleport around their rooms and cast magical attacks towards Link, and when defeated, burst into flames, leaving no corpse behind. As far as where they come from though, it's about as unclear as any of the other wizard robes in the franchise. They appear to be of a race of humanoid creatures that learned magic and decided to serve the forces of darkness, which in this case would be Majora and its lackeys. I don't personally think they're completely human though, on account of their rather large stature and goblin-like appearance. Moving on, the next bosses are the Gerudo Pirates from the Pirate Stronghold, which are really just Gerudo women, and this is one of those bosses in Majora's Mask that's only really explainable by way of Hyrule Encyclopedia's interpretation of Termina, which again is to say that Termina was created out of the Skull Kid's twisted memories of Hyrule. Clearly the Skull Kid either had heard of the Gerudo women of the desert or had seen them before, and I'm personally leaning towards the latter because Iron Knuckles and even the Witch Sisters Koome and Kotake, which are straight out of the deserts of Ocarina of Time, are also present in Majora's Mask, but they all operate and act completely differently, with no ties to their original lore. In this game, the Gerudo aren't desert dwellers, but are rather fearsome pirates. And without getting into too much of the narrative, they cross paths with Link when Link takes it upon himself to save the eggs of Lulu, who is the main singer of the super sick Zora rock group called the 
the Indiegogos. The Garuda pirates, under the leadership of one particular pirate named Avail, stole Lulu's seven baby eggs because the Skull Kid told them they were the key to entering the Great Bay Temple, which they wanted to enter in search of getting rich off of the treasure within. Pirates, am I right? Anyway, that's where the Garuda swordswomen as mini-bosses come in. Link fights three of them in the game, each of which are guarding one of Lulu's eggs. Next up is one of two mini-bosses in the Great Bay Temple, a giant eyeball monster known as Wart. Wart also appears in the Secret Shrine, but there are reasons to believe that all the bosses in the Secret Shrine are actually duplicate bosses from the Land of Termina, which would mean that in reality, there's only really one Wart. On the old Great Hyrule Encyclopedia that used to be an actual online resource hosted on the official Zelda.com, but has since been taken down for unknown reasons, Wart was said to have been a guardian of the Great Bay Temple at one point. It's unknown as to why Wart is no longer considered a guardian of the Great Bay Temple, but since it's a theme with the game as well as most Zelda to games, I'll chalk it up to the corruption of the Great Bay Temple's corresponding giant mask. Next up is the fun stuff, the bosses of Ikana. And by fun, I mean scary and depressing. To start, the entire land of Ikana is that of a forgotten and barren wasteland that was once the mighty kingdom of Ikana and became the location of countless wars and battles and bloodshed and just general unpleasantness. It's also currently experiencing a very particular plague, one that entails the countless dead soldiers and foreign assassins coming back to life. On the plus side, this makes explaining a large portion of its bosses easier since said large portion of bosses in Ikana Valley are the aforementioned undead. According to the undead king of Ikana named Egos Du Ikana, the undead are all awry and evil and restless because someone flung open the doors of the Stone Tower Temple, from which a dark wind blows. With all that being said, the first boss you face in Ikana is the undead giant who served in Ikana's army as its captain known as Captain Kida, or Skull Kida, who upon being resurrected immediately challenges you to a race because he's got the need for speed. The captain was actually defeated in battle, which brought him shame that carried with him into death and is also the reason why he's dead. However, upon being defeated by Link, he passes his captain hat on to Link and asks you to give his final words that the war is over to his men, who still linger on as stall children in the mortal realm, serving their captain even in death. And after he tells Link this, he asks his captain if he may take his leave. And finally, he takes it. Following the undead trail all the way to the crumbling castle of Ikana, Link will then meet the lackeys of the king, two unnamed Stalfo Skelly Bros, and the king himself in the throne room. Upon defeating all of them and curing their undead bodies by burning them with light, Egos du Ikana explains that the kingdom of Ikana is now fallen due to petty battles over ultimately meaningless conflicts, the kind of which was beginning to unfold as his lackeys began to bicker just moments before burning away into nothingness. He also explains that the dead began to rise because of the dark spell originating from the Stone Tower Temple, and after teaching Link the Elegy of Emptiness which summons forth a soldier with no heart and is also the reason why the Ben Drowned Creepypasta still haunts fans to this day, burns away himself asking Link to shine the light of justice upon his kingdom with his dying breath. This Light of Justice comment also seems to imply that even before the Plague of the Undead was a scourge upon Ikana, injustices had already fatally infected her heart. Now, there are a few other mini-bosses present in Ikana, but they're legitimately hard to explain because technically speaking they shouldn't exist here, such as the Iron Knuckles and the Big Poe and the Poe Sisters. Poes themselves exist as lingering spirits of the dead and are a staple of the Zelda franchise, and in a land soaked with blood and lined with countless bodies, lingering spirits seems to be a given. But it's the Iron Knuckles and Poe Sisters specifically that must have come from the Skull Kid's memories, especially the latter, who are a group of four sisters that once resided inside of the Forest Temple of Ocarina of Time, which the Skull Kid lived right outside of. Especially given that in the Child Timeline, which is when this game takes place, Link would have never turned into an adult and killed the Poe sisters in the Adult Timeline, so logically they should still be located within their Forest Temple, and the same goes for the Iron Knuckles in the Spirit Temple. However, because we're working off of the assumption that Termina is a twisted version of Hyrule that is somewhat parallel to to it, we are going to go with that explanation for the Iron Knuckles and Poe Sisters and even Sharp and Flat present in Ikona Valley. The final two bosses of this first category are the mini-bosses of the Stone Tower Temple itself, the first of which is the Garo Master, the strongest and master of the Garo, who are present all over the land of Ikana. The Garo are also undead, just like most of the other monsters in Ikana, and are actually spies that hail from a country that was at war with Ikana when it was alive. According to Pamela's father, who's a super smart scientist professor dude, the Garo may even be hollow underneath 
beneath their robes. And one of the reasons to believe this is that it is Garo law to destroy their own bodies upon death, leaving no corpse behind. Something they still do even in their undeath. The fact that the Garo Master is here within the temple and the fact that the Garo Master knows the secret of flipping the temple is strange. Very strange. And actually leads me to believe that the Garo Master may have actually originated from the temple. See, Egos do Icona says pretty clearly that it's an impenetrable stronghold that hundreds of his soldiers could not topple. This implies that it's not his stronghold, not a creation of the Kingdom of Icona. And since it does require some jumping to infiltrate, which the Garo ninjas are all too proficient at, perhaps the stone tower actually was the home of the Garo. But that's just a tiny little mini theory to explain the Garo Master. The next and final not main boss of the game would be none other than the one, the only, the creepy, the vague Gomez. Now this scythe-wielding boss hovers above the ground, covers itself in bats, and has a rather crazed expression on its face, and of course is one of the most unexplained beings in the history of the Zelda franchise, so that's awesome. The aforementioned Zelda.com encyclopedia that's no longer visible online once said that Gomez was a powerful vampire, which kind of sort of explains all the bats, although whether or not the old official Zelda website definition is canon is debatable. Either way though, I think that Gomez is most likely a creation of whoever cursed the land of Ikana by throwing the doors to the Stone Tower Temple open and here's why. It's because thematically, everything about Gomez is dark. Gomez is surrounded by bats, which are nocturnal predators. Gomez itself is so dark that you can barely see any details of its body other than its eyes and gaping, smiling mouth. It also wields a giant reaper-like scythe, which is to represent death and also goes hand in hand with darkness and is the antithesis of light and life. And since Icona Kingdom is said to be enshrouded in darkness that stems from the Stone Tower Temple, it could be that Gomez himself is the incarnation of said darkness. In other words, Gomez is the curse that was placed upon Icona, the one that's making the dead come to life. But who made the curse, you ask? We'll get to that in a bit, but a cool little last detail I'll cover about Gomez is that his name in French is Le Fauché, which means the Grim Reaper and is also the French name of the Death Sword from Twilight Princess, both of which are bosses that wield giant bladed weapons and resemble the Grim Reaper. Perhaps their commonality is that they are both bringers of death, or rather, bringers of undeath. With all of the mini-bosses of the first category of the game out of the way, it's time to start focusing on the main bosses of the game, specifically the four giant masks that Majora created in order to capture the four giants of Termina, which are the four guardian deities of the land of Termina, which was once a land with only one country and no divisions or borders. Let's start off by briefly covering the story of the giants in case anybody doesn't know, or needs a refresher. The giants were not only the protectors of Termina, but were also the personal friends of the Skull Kid, perhaps even his only friends. Eventually though, the giants decided they wanted to sleep, I guess, and in doing so walked a hundred steps north, south, east, and west, thus dividing the land into four quadrants and leaving the Skull Kid behind. This broke the Skull Kid's heart, and reportedly he then started to unleash his anger upon the people of Termina. And this is apparently long before the events of Majora's Mask. Eventually, the people called out to the giants to come to save them from this naughtiness, and they then told the Skull Kid to leave Termina or they will literally tear him apart. Yeesh. This broke the Skull Kid's heart even more, and then he he returned, quote, to the heavens, where we can only assume he then met the two fairies in the Lost Woods and eventually stumbled across the Happy Mask Salesman and then Link and then the rest is history. Now, remember when I said at the start of this video that we're going with the encyclopedia's explanation of the creation of Termina? Well, we still are, but I also wanted to state that this history between the giants and the Skull Kid seemingly proves that Termina must have existed before the Skull Kid donned Majora's Mask, meaning Termina couldn't have been created by the Mask, right? Well, yes and no. See, I think Termina already existed and that it's a different world that exists somewhere deep below the land of Hyrule, and it's accessible via a portal located inside an old tree in the Lost Woods. And no, I'm not going to expand on that because Termina isn't the point of this video. I also believe that the Skull Kid found this world one day and began going there back and forth out of curiosity, eventually befriending the four giants before eventually being banished from there. However, the Skull Kid returns to Termina after obtaining the Majora's Mask, only this time his mind has begun to become quite altered due to the corruption of Majora's power. Either this or Majora really did create Termina when the Skull Kid donned the mask, it's just that the Skull Kid donned the mask some time ago, which I suppose is possible, but unlikely since the Happy Mask Salesman appears here in the child timeline. Either way, at some point he gets an idea, and that idea is revenge on the giants in the land of Termina itself. Now I'll get into the entirety of the revenge plan more in the final section covering Majora, but as far as the giants are concerned, basically the four giant masks were created by the Skull Kid slash Majora in order to trap the giants inside of them, transforming Forming their physical bodies into monsters of the Skull Kid's design. One became Odalwa, the giant masked jungle warrior. One became Gott, the giant
giant mechanical goat monster. Another became Gyorg, the giant fish monster, and the last became Twin Mold, the giant masked insects. The monsters were, in my opinion, none other than the giants themselves, who took on these forms upon their imprisonment. Kind of like the imprisoned from Skyward Sword, which is Demise's transformation into a giant avocado, with squishy toes, although it's unknown as to what made them transform into what they did specifically. Since the four giant masks eventually returned to Majora's side, though, I can only assume that the masks and subsequent monsters were designed and created by Majora itself. Once trapped within the masks, the giants then became the scourges of the lands they swore to protect, each cursing their own respective quadrants of Termina. The southern giant became Odalwa of the Woodfall Temple and cursed the swamp into becoming toxic. The northern giant became Got of the Snowhead Temple and cursed the usually warm and balmy mountain into a fierce, unending blizzard. The western giant became Gyorg of the Great Bay Temple and plagued the waters with uneasy murkiness and caused the weather to become even hotter. And the eastern giant became Twin Mold of the Stone Tower Temple and covered the land in darkness and undeath. Their corruption of the lands also led to the creation of several monsters and bosses that we already discussed, such as the Geckos or Egos du Icana. But at the end of it all, after Link frees all the giants from their evil mask shackles, we're left with one burning question. Why? Why did Majora specifically curse these giants into these specific monsters? It's finally time to talk about the ones that started it all, Majora and the Skull Kid. And here's another fair warning, buckle your seatbelts because this is about to get crazy. Most fans know by heart the story of the Skull Kid, a mischievous childlike forest imp that donned an evil mask and acted out in probably the worst temper tantrum the world has ever seen. But the character that really gets people going is that of Majora. Where did it come from? Is it an it or was it a person at one point? And why is it now sealed inside a mask? Let us begin with what we know. According to the Happy Mask Salesman, the Majora's Mask was created by an ancient tribe who used the mask for hexing rituals, which is another word for cursing or bewitching. So, you know, this ancient tribe was definitely not one of the good ones. However, that ancient tribe that used the mask for cursing others decided themselves that the mask was too powerful and could lead to too much catastrophe. So this hexing tribe sealed the mask away in the shadows. Interestingly, in the original Japanese version of the game, the Happy Mask Salesman says that the original tribe was destroyed and that there was in fact a calamity brought about by Mujuda's mask and that, quote, our ancestors sealed it away. Our ancestors, as in his and Link's shared ancestors, which would be the Hylians themselves. It doesn't necessarily prove much, but it is interesting to think about. An unknown amount of time passes and eventually the Happy Mask Salesman gets his own hands on the mask, although we don't know how or when or even why he knew about the mask in the first place. Regardless, the Skull Kid eventually steals the mask from him and cue the events of the game. The Skull Kid then begins to undergo an evolution from harmless prankster to more serious prankster to then taking actual serious advances in his revenge plot and decides to trap his old friends inside the giant masks, curse the land with numerous ailments, and finally bring the moon crashing into the face of the earth in order to destroy the world in defiance of the festival that celebrates the sun and the moon. Things so far are ultimately pretty easy to understand. Kid puts on mask, gets corrupted by mask. Until the dark encounter with the Skull Kid atop the clock tower. See, once the Skull Kid's plot is stopped by way of the giants literally holding the moon in place, Majora's mask detaches from the Skull Kid and proves for the first time that it is sentient, and this is where stuff gets super interesting. It then proceeds to call the Skull Kid a puppet and enters the moon itself, empowering it even more and continuing its downward descent to destroy the world. But wait, you might be thinking, I thought that was the Skull Kid's revenge plan. Why does Majora, who may have been created by ancient Hylians, want to destroy Termina? What does Termina have to do with Majora's Mask? The only thing that ties Majora's Mask to Termina and the Giants is the Skull Kid himself. So here's my theory, and of course you're welcome to believe whichever one you'd like. Now I have two theories, one of which is the literal theory of what's happening here within the lore of the universe, and the other of which is the theory of the symbolism behind all of this, and how it makes sense on a meta scale. But let's start with the lore theory. When Link enters the moon, personally, I feel like he enters the mind of Majora. I mean, a limitless grassy field with a tree in it being inside the moon is probably metaphysical. You know, probably. There are also children running around wearing the four giant masks with one sitting alone wearing Majora's mask itself. But the reason why the mind of Majora is so lonely feeling and the child wearing Majora's mask sits by themselves with nobody to play with is because that is a reflection of exactly what happened to the Skull Kid. It's what was inside the Skull Kid's heart and memories. And because the Skull Kid felt it, Majora now feels it. That's why the four giant mask children are free to play amongst themselves while the Skull Kid slash Majora child sits alone. It's a perfect picture of Termina's history told from the perspective of the Skull Kid. But this fictional reality also shares the memories of Majora. That's why the kids look like the Happy Mask Salesman, and why they ask Link if he'll be a Happy Mask Salesman too, since Majora 
Jor remembers the Happy Mask Salesman as the only individual in the past countless amount of years to pay attention to it. According to the old Meverse website that, again, has since been taken down, the Happy Mask Salesman himself says that he's never met these children before, and that he doesn't think they're normal kids, and that he's pretty sure there's some figment created by the Majora's Mask. He even recognizes that they have the same hairstyle as him. So young, yet so stylish. But now we're left wondering, everything in this grassy field, all of the dialogue from these children, their appearances, the masks, it all stems from either the memories of the Skull Kid or the Majora's Mask itself, but why? Well, I believe it's because of the fact that Majora's Mask is now alive. But let me explain. See, the Majora's Mask, when worn, gives the user the power to make their wishes a reality. Much like the Triforce, actually, but yet the opposite of it. See, the Triforce will grant the wish of its user, but will separate if its user is unbalanced. Meaning the Triforce requires balance. Majora's Mask, on the other hand, creates imbalance. It corrupts. It takes the deepest, darkest parts within your mind and brings them to the surface, eventually making those dark thoughts worsen and completely take control. Think about it like the Venom symbiote and Spider-Man, but if the Venom symbiote also granted the wishes of Spider-Man. Now give that symbiote to an angry, emotionally distraught human being who has not yet figured out how to control their emotions, like a child or a skull kid. That in and of itself is a scary notion, but I think that the true horror is actually even worse. See, there's a reason why Majora's Mask initially wasn't alive, but it is now, and why it was so terrifying to the ancient tribe once they discovered its true nature. In my opinion, Majora's Mask darkens the wearer's heart because it feeds off of it. It grows from it, and eventually it becomes alive because of it and forms a literal incarnation of the darkness of its wearer's heart. Their darkest desires, their deepest hurts, their inescapable loneliness, and the culmination of all of their wrath. And that is the heartbreaking, deep, dark horror of Majora's Mask. It's why Majora pushed the dark thoughts and feelings within the Skull Kid to the surface. It's why Majora continued to enter the moon and pursue the same dark intentions given to it from the Skull Kid. It's why the moon area created by Majora is lonely and desolate. And it's why Majora itself is wild and childish and full of wrath like the Skull Kid and begins forming a veiny organic body based off of these very emotions in front of our eyes. And we know this is the entire darkness of Majora because after defeating it, the evil has officially escaped the mask, proven by the Happy Mask Salesman. But one other aspect of the final fight that I don't have to explain, but I will anyway because according to the Hyrule Historia is the canonical version of events, would be the Fierce Deity's mask that Link dons in order to transform into the Fierce Deity and kill Majora's mask once and for all. The Japanese term for it is Kishin, which is used to refer to gods that have a righteous fury against the enemies of humanity. And according to Aonuma himself, the Fierce Deity mask is supposed to be the culmination of all the memories of Termina's people. Their combined will, if you will. It seems to me that just like Majora's mask is the incarnation of darkness of the Skull Kid's heart, the Fierce Deity is the incarnation of the righteous fury of humanity. Now, it's given to Link from inside the Majora Moon area from the child representing Majora itself so that they can play good cop, bad cop before fighting, which is strange but makes more sense when you look at the situation symbolically. And to explain the symbolism, let's start again with Majora's mask. The deadly heart-shaped ancient hexing mask is a picture of what happens if the dark and harmful will towards others inside our hearts is left unchecked, specifically with a focus on how angry and wrathful we can be in our childhood, when our emotions have yet to mature. And the masks that Link gives to the moon children that run around wanting nothing but to play games represents the different pieces of our childhoods, our imaginations, the games we would play. And when you give the final piece of your immaturity away, you receive the more grim and serious maturity of adulthood in return, which has the power to destroy even the darkest of childhood intentions or hurts. Because, after all, isn't the Skull Kid's wrath warranted? Wasn't he hurt by the giants, his closest friends? The problem is, he went too far and wasn't mature enough to deal with it. So simply put, Majora's Mask, to me, among many things, is an allegory for growing up and overcoming and defeating the traumas of our childhood. The darkness we so often bring with us. But that's just my thoughts on the matter. A Zelda game without bosses is like a soda vending machine that only sells club soda, you know, that flavorless sparkling water. Which is gross, I hate drinking that stuff. I'd much rather have a Fanta, or a Sprite, or a Diet Coke. The simplest way to go about explaining Wind Waker's many bosses and mini bosses would be to just go in order of the game's dungeon, so we're gonna do just that. Starting with the very first dungeon in the game, Dragon Roost Cavern, located on Dragon Roost Isle, the very first mini boss you face is a Moblin. And actually, technically, you face a Bokoblin as a mini boss, but 
before the Moblin, way back in the Forsaken Fortress. Both of these enemies are just regular monsters stemming from Hyrule, which may or may not have originated entirely from Demise's demonic power many years ago, depending on what you believe. But in The Wind Waker, the only thing that really needs explaining is how they're here. And by here, I mean up here, as in on the surface of the ocean and not down in Hyrule where they came from. Fortunately for us, the answer is rather simple. Ganondorf himself brought these monsters up from deep beneath the waves when he began to execute his plan of regaining the pieces of the Triforce, having it ripped from his clutches all those years ago by the Hero of Time and Princess Zelda. But more on Ganondorf's story later in the video. The boss of Dragon Roost Cavern is a giant, totally not nightmare-inducing, arachnid, centipede, lava monster, insect thing known as Goma. Now, according to a direct quote from the Wind Waker's Great Deku Tree, the monsters that stir in the Forbidden Woods are there because of Ganondorf's return, and the same reasoning can probably be used to blanket explain a lot of the monsters' appearances in the game, including the likes of Goma herself. While that may seem like an adequate explanation, I wouldn't make these videos if I didn't think I could bring something else to the table. And in this case, I'd like to mention that I think what Ganondorf did specifically is he simply introduced one of the Magtail monsters into the cavern at some point, which then grew into Goma, which then began to lay eggs and give birth to other Magtails and spread them throughout the dungeon. I mean, Goma really does seem like a big version of the smaller Magtail monster, with being centipede-like, immune to lava, having a single eye and giant pincers and all that. Who knows, maybe there even would have been several Gomas if Link hadn't obliterated these ones. Next up, we have the formerly mentioned Forbidden Woods, located right next to the rather friendly and not forbidden Forest Haven. Now, I'm not going to go super in-depth into explaining the dungeon itself and why it's separate from the Forest Haven proper and why I think it very closely resembles the Forest Haven because I'm probably going to start up a series on the lore of the dungeons here pretty soon. So I'm going to skip straight to the bosses. The mini boss of the dungeon is once again an insect monster known as Mothula, which comes in two versions, winged and non-winged, though I personally assume that the winged version is the fully mature version. Just like all the other mini bosses in the game, Mothula itself is not very one of a kind. In fact, there are many of them in the game across various little caves and such, and they actually make appearances in other Zelda games such as A Link to the Past, where they appear in the Skull Woods, which is the Dark World variant of the Lost Woods. Coincidence? I think not. What Mothulas are is a very dangerous species of mutant moth that can spurt out little babies called morths that are little one-eyed spiky balls that love to latch onto moving organisms like Link and just kind of sit there, slowing you down. They don't want to eat you or anything, they just invade your personal space, which is rude. The morths themselves are present all over the place in the Forbidden Woods, which leads me to believe that Ganondorf did a very similar thing here like he did with the Magtails in Dragon Roost Cavern and just released an infestation of morths to take over the place. Lots of fun. The main boss of the Forbidden Woods is a bit more abstract to explain in that it's a living killer plant known as the Kale Demos. And seeing as the theme of the entire dungeon is overgrown killer nature, it makes sense to me that the Kale Demos would be an overgrown, more deadly version of a Boko Baba, of which there are several present here in the Forbidden Woods and even on the Forest Haven. It's so massive that it uses its roots as weapons and vines to literally detach from the ground and theoretically be able to move all around the place if it wanted to. Heck, it could probably vacation on Windfall Island. As far as what its name means, it's unsure since the original Japanese name for the Kale Demos is Kare Demos, so there really aren't any hints there. But in the Spanish version of the game, its name is Villa Pendulia, which if translated in Latin means to blaspheme or to revile, or if translated in Corsican means vilification, which is kind of the same thing. Following up on this name meaning, it could be interpreted that it relates to the Forbidden Woods directly since the Forbidden Woods itself is more than likely the corrupted version of the old Lost Woods. But more on that in the probable upcoming dungeon video. The Kale Demos can also be killed immediately with the forest water from the Deku Tree, so the corruption theory kind of makes sense. As far as what led to this monster plant becoming a monster plant, it can be assumed that it was due to the same curse placed upon the woods by Ganondorf that led to all the overgrown vines around the place and of course the wonderful Morths and Mothula. Moving on, next up we have the bosses from the Tower of the Gods, which alternatively actually is not an area that was corrupted or infested with evil or anything of the sort. Actually, quite the opposite. The Tower of the Gods and its enemies within were all created by certain people in the past. You know, kind of like all the Sheikah shrines in Breath of the Wild. The mini boss of the tower is the very first Dark Nut you face in the game. And the reason why I say the first Dark Nut is because there are many, many Dark Nuts in other locations throughout this game. This one specifically, however, is a bit special because it's located within the mostly untouched Tower of the Gods, thus giving even more credence to an older theory of mine about the Dark Nuts and their literal possible blood relations to Link, which I will link in the description below if you're interested in a much deeper dive. For the time being, however, it's my interpretation that the Dark Nuts are actually corrupted 
old knights of Hyrule. After all, every single one of them in the Wind Waker wears a knight's crest, which has pretty obvious Loftwing symbolism on it. And as a reminder, Loftwings are the symbol of the Hylian royal family, and I highly doubt that every single one of the Dark Nuts would be able to steal a knight's crest. I believe this particular Dark Nut was placed here to test the hero, like all the other various enemies and mechanisms in the Tower of the Gods. But that it was tainted by Ganondorf's magic due to other reasons that I go into in the aforementioned video. The boss of the dungeon is a grand combat construct that snorts arrows known as Godan, the Great Arbiter. Godan's figurine describes it as a construct that was placed there directly by the gods themselves in order to test the hero's combat prowess. And this is pretty much entirely accurate, actually. It is a tester, and its title, The Great Arbiter, literally means the Great Decider, as in it decides whether or not the hero is worthy. It's pretty cut and dry, and the only question remaining is whether or not the gods themselves actually literally crafted Godan with their own hands, or if they tasked certain other people to do so in their stead. Personally, my money's on the Sheikah. I mean, come on, with all the eye symbolism everywhere, the grand ancient technology, the servitude to the gods, and the neon blue energy, yeah, it all seems to fit the criteria. Moving on, the next dungeon that Link has to fight through is actually a return to the Forsaken Fortress. Now that he's descended down to old Hyrule and retrieved the Master Sword from its secret chamber of the sages, the first boss that Link faces is the mini-boss known as Phantom Ganon. And this should be a familiar enemy for many fans of the series because Phantom Ganon made his debut in the previous game in the timeline, Ocarina of Time, where in that game, Phantom Ganon is heavily implied to be a separate, living, demonic being created by Ganondorf via his dark powers in order to fight Link, after which he gets banished to the, quote, gap between dimensions, which probably means nothingness in a spooky, cosmic, Lovecraftian kind of way. The Phantom Ganons uh, in The Wind Waker are largely the same. They are phantom versions of Ganondorf himself that he sends out to try to commit murder upon Link. They even use the same Dead Man's Volley moveset to attack Link. One thing you might be wondering though is why did Ganondorf not send out a phantom Ganon or two to protect the Forsaken Fortress the first time around? And this is actually because of Link. See, as Ganondorf himself proves to us, when Link drew the Master Sword, it actually released the seal on Ganondorf's power. Previously, I guess, he was just running on fumes. But with his true powers restored, he's able to construct an unlimited number of these phantoms to fight against Link. And by the way, if you're interested in why the Master Sword was able to seal Ganondorf's power and also all of the Kingdom of Hyrule in stasis and why it looks so different and why it's positioned somewhere completely different to its last location in Ocarina of Time, check out this theory I did on the possibility of a second Master Sword. Y you're gonna love it. It's really neat, actually. And one last thing I'll mention about the Phantom Ganons in Wind Waker is that their swords actually bear an inscription on the blade. The inscription reads Zubora Gabora when read in Hylian, which are the names of the two smithies in the mountain village in Majora's Mask. Yeah, there's probably a theory or 12 there, but we don't have time for that, so anyway, the actual boss of the Forsaken Fortress this time around is that big, gnarly, nasty, giant, child-kidnapping bird known as the monstrous Helmarok King. The bird looks very, very similar to the Kargroks in the game. In fact, they have nearly identical feather patterns on their bodies and wings, nearly identical feet, and the Helmarok's tail looks like a more grandeur and duplicated version of the Kargroks. This pretty heavily implies that the Helmarok is an overgrown version of a Kargrok. Maybe this is what happens when you actually eat all of your veggies growing up. I guess mom was on to something. Now it is possible that the Helmarok is so massive due to Ganondorf's influence or power or corruption, but I personally find that a bit difficult to believe since his powers were much weaker prior to Link's removal of the Master Sword, meaning the greater chance is that the Helmarok is really just a big Kargrok. I also wanted to mention that it shares both a name and an extremely similar fight to the Helmasaur King from A Link to the Past, both of which actually share the same name in Japanese, Jikuroku. Link must use a mighty hammer to break both of their helmets before being able to unleash punishment on their faces. And the Helmasaur King is also just a bigger version of smaller Helmasaurs, which is yet another similarity to the Helmarok King. Helmasaurs make other appearances in the Child Timeline and the Fallen Timeline, but never do pop up in the Adult Timeline. Perhaps this means that the Wind Waker Kargorok species is the evolution of the Helmasaur species, which would fit into Wind Waker's evolved Hyrule theme with other races and monsters. And Kargoroks and Twilight Princess are very lizard-like. And since Twilight Princess takes place sooner after Ocarina of Time than Wind Waker does, that could mean that these Kargoroks are in their middle step on their way to evolving into the ones we see in the Wind Waker, but I digress. I didn't really mean to go into Kargoroks this much, but there you go, the Helmarok King explained. The next dungeon that the brave young green boy must venture through is the Earth Temple, the first boss of which is a Stalfos. Now, anyone who knows The Legend of Zelda knows about Stalfos enemies. Simply put, a Stalfos is a demonically resurrected pile of bones. Could be anyone's bones, could be a human's or a Lizalfos 
or a Bacoblins or yours or mine. That would be gross. But the Stalfoses and Wind Waker share explanations with all Stalfos enemies throughout the entire franchise, which is that they are resurrected baddies that arise via the power of evil, which stems from Ganondorf, which stems from Demise. The main boss of the Earth Temple is Jalhalla, which is a large Poe made of a conglomerate of smaller Poes. If you watched my previous boss lore video on Twilight Princess, you'll probably recall that I stated that I believed that the Death Sword from that game is also a conglomeration of dead spirits or Poes. In this case, you can literally watch as multiple Poes gather into the Mask of Jalhalla to form its giant bod, which pretty much immediately explains everything. Well, almost everything. See, Jalhalla is actually very old, ancient even. It was actually the being responsible for murdering the previous Sage of Earth named Laruto, Medley's predecessor and also the only Zora you see in the game. When you combine this with the fact that it once again appears as a mini-boss alongside Goma, the Kale Demos, and Mulgara in Ganon's castle, it can be inferred that this means that it, or more specifically the mask that forms its big bod, was created by Ganondorf. Perhaps he once again just released a bunch of Poes and the mask itself into the Earth Temple in order to corrupt it, like he's done several times before in this very video. As a reminder, Poes in this franchise are specifically ill-spirited spirits that roam the land of the living because they have unfinished business and are filled with negativity and thoughts of violence. Combine a bunch of them into a big Poe, and you get Jalhalla. The second to last dungeon in the game is the Wind Temple. The mini-boss of the temple is a whiz robe, which again is not a unique enemy, but it kind of is because it wears red, and it's also much more powerful than the other lesser whiz robes, and can even summon other lesser whiz robes to fight for it, which is kind of meta. Now as I explained in the Majora's Mask boss lore video, whiz robes are recurring enemies across the Zelda franchise stemming from the original game of a variable power level. Sometimes they're normal enemies that you can fight a bunch of at a time. Other times, like in Majora's Mask or Wind Waker, they're powerful enough to merit mini-boss battles all by themselves. Another variable about them is their appearance, which shifts from looking like a human witch to Gru from Despicable Me to an anthropomorphic toucan in this game. I personally believe that all whiz robes are simply members of a race of individuals located somewhere in Hyrule that masters dark magic and either due to that mastery or due to their own personal reasons decides to serve the forces of darkness, who in this case is Ganondorf. What's most intriguing about their appearance in Wind Waker is their bird-like physical features such as their toucan-like beaks or their sleeves that look like wings, or the fact that they can hover in the air and fly. Given that this was also the game that introduced us to the Rito, who are the race of bird people that evolved from the Zora, it's only natural for people to wonder about whether or not the whiz robes are members of the Rito as well, which could very well be the case. Personally though, I tend to think a bit more simplistically. To me, it just seems like the whiz robes might have used their magic and turned themselves into these bird-like forms in order to achieve flight, which they can do in this game as opposed to their earlier iterations, which could only teleport around the place. But it's true given their bird characteristics, which is conveniently in the same game that introduced us to the Rito, they could be whiz robes that stem from the Rito race. There's no evidence to prove definitively one way or the other. And the Rito also pretty much all have long sleeves that turn into wings. Also, there are lesser whiz robes that appear in the Tower of the Gods. As I mentioned earlier, all of the mechanisms and constructs within the Tower of the Gods were constructed by the will of the gods and for the purposes of testing Link. So how then could whiz robes be located inside? Well, it's evident that at least some of Ganon's power was able to enter the tower since there are keys and bubbles and choo-choos and lesser whiz robes and a crazed dark nut located within. So I suppose it's possible that Ganondorf was able to sneak in a couple monsters. I'm not sure when he would have been able to do this, but that's neither here nor there. The boss of the Wind Temple is a giant flying sand monster known as Mulgara. And just like Jalhalla in the Earth Temple, Mulgara is assumedly responsible for the death of the Wind Sage named Fado, Makar's predecessor, and the only Kokiri you see in the game. And just to follow suit with the whole big monster with small versions of big monster vibes that the entire game has been giving off this whole time, Mulgara can also release its little babies to attack Link, affectionately referred to as Mulgara Larvae. In the Legend of Zelda series, it seems that certain words or phrases of words are often used to refer to that type of enemy. For instance, a Baba is always a plant. A Blin is always a humanoid, usually pig-like monster. A Stall is always an undead enemy. A Foes is a knight-like enemy. A Rock is a bird. And a Mole is a sand or worm-like monster. In this manner, the Mulgara shares its sand swimming capabilities with that of the Molduga of Breath of the Wild, or the Moldorms from several other games. And due to its reappearance in Ganon's tower, and Fado directly saying that he was attacked by Ganondorf, and the encyclopedia stating that Ganon's minions attacked the temples, it can be assumed that Mulgara originated from, you guessed it, Ganondorf himself. Seriously, it's like after his defeat at the end of Ocarina of Time, he just thought to himself, you know what I should do this time around in order to guarantee me a win? Insects. Giant insects. But speaking of the big man himself, it's finally his time to shine. So without further ado, let's talk about the man, the myth, the undying legend, Ganondorf. 
Ganondorf Dragmire. Ganon's Tower is the final dungeon in the game, and as such, Ganon himself is the final boss. Both of them, in fact. See, the first time you encounter Ganondorf, it's not actually Ganondorf, but is rather a Ganon. Now, for a much more in-depth explanation as to what I believe Ganon is as opposed to Ganondorf, and to not be too redundant in these videos, check out the Breath of the Wild boss lore video where I went into much more detail explaining it. In a nutshell, though, I personally believe that Ganondorf will transform into a Ganon when Ganondorf is infused with a great power source. With THE Ganon, as in the original anthropomorphic pig-like monster Ganon being Ganondorf's Triforce of Power transformation. However, if you recall, at this point in the timeline, that Ganon is dead, thanks to the Hero of Time. And this is why that Ganon does not make an appearance in Wind Waker. It's also why Ganondorf himself does not physically transform into a Ganon in this game, even though it kind of looks like he does. In reality, though, that's just Puppet Ganon, who's being controlled by Ganondorf, who is awaiting Link above Puppet Ganon's chamber on top of the tower. My take on the matter, and of course you're always welcome to believe whichever take you want, is that Puppet Ganon is the big version, if you will, of the Phantom Ganons located elsewhere in the game. Just, you know, to follow suit with the aforementioned small version and big version of monsters that this game is so fond of using. I believe that the Puppet Ganon is essentially the most powerful version of Phantom Ganon that Ganondorf could create. Which again, also explains why Ganondorf himself does not transform into Puppet Ganon, unlike in Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess, when he did literally transform into the Triforce-powered Ganon and the Twilight-powered Dark Beast Ganon. Anyway, once Link kills Puppet Ganon with Arrows of Light, he then ascends to face Ganondorf himself, who has had his Triforce of Power this entire time because he still retained it following his sealing away at the end of Ocarina of Time. Huge props to Nintendo, by the way, for leaving us with this foreshadowing cliffhanger way back in 1998. To be honest, Wind Waker's version of Ganondorf has got to be one of my favorites, if not my favorite. Because this is a Ganondorf who learned patience. He learned how to wait and bide his time to build up scraps of power at first and eventually break out of the seal that he was placed in so many years ago. He's more solemn and mature than any of his other iterations and does not necessarily wish to bring unnecessary harm to Link and Zelda. He even goes so far as to try to reassure Link by saying, do not fear, I will not kill you. And he says that he wishes to sever that which binds them together so that he would not have to keep fighting literal children every few centuries. He also gives more insight into the reasoning behind his usurper her actions in Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess. The reason why he so badly craves Hyrule's throne is because he's jealous, covetous. The Gerudo Desert, his home, is a harsh environment that few species can survive. In the day, it's blisteringly hot, and in the night, it's bone-chillingly frigid, something that we can see firsthand in Breath of the Wild. As the king of the Gerudo women who somehow lived in the desert, he wanted better for them. He wanted the beautiful landscapes and temperate climates and bountiful fields that the winds of Hyrule brought to the people of Hyrule and thus he decided to conquer the royal family and try to take it by force. But now that Hyrule is all but dead and his people are gone, we're left with one final question. Why? Why is Ganondorf still striving so hard to obtain the Triforce, so long after everyone has vanished and the world has moved on? Well, that's actually the entire point. Have you ever felt nostalgic? Ganondorf did. He never wanted to hurt people, at least not initially. All he ever wanted was Hyrule. He had heard the legends of an all-powerful relic that could grant the wishes of its user, and he always wanted to use that wish to obtain Hyrule for himself and his people. But as close as he came to the Triforce, he never got to make that wish. So here, after countless years have gone by and the world has moved on from the old kingdom beneath the waves, Ganondorf never forgot about that land that he loved, Hyrule. And as he finally pieced the Triforce together again, he reached his hand into the sky and cried out to the gods above to resurrect Hyrule from its watery slumber and give it to him. But just before he touches the omnipotent relic, Daphnis Nahansen Hyrule himself, the last king of Hyrule, touches it first and instead wishes for the opposite. That the world would finally forget about the sins of the kingdom, the crimes of the Gerudo, and the entire land of Hyrule itself be drowned forever, and Ganondorf along with it. And after all this time, as the ocean begins to literally crash in over their heads with a great downpour of rain, Ganondorf cannot help but laugh in his utter, bitter defeat. And it's at this point that he lets his old, angry self shine through again, and he decides to try to kill Link, Zelda, and the King, but is once again defeated for the last time by the duo of Hylia's descendant and her chosen hero. The last thing Ganondorf feels before entering the gap between dimensions himself is the blissful wind of the beautiful kingdom of Hyrule.
A Zelda game without bosses is like a bowl of ramen with only oh. noodles. It's like, wait, what? You've heard this intro before? Oh, I see. I used it in the last video. Okay, l let me do something new. <clears throat> a Zelda game without bosses is like beef stew with only beef in it. There, a completely new intro. To start, we're going to go over all of the bosses in the game that were made through the power of the fused shadow, which would encompass the first three. Diababa from the Forest Temple, Phyrus from the Goron Mines, and more fuel from the Lakebed Temple, each of which are pretty easy to explain. As a reminder, or in in case you've never played the game, the three main light spirits in the game were responsible for sealing away the powerful dark magic that the interlopers created in order to spite the gods. See, the goddesses themselves weren't the biggest fans of this idea, so they had the light spirits seal the magic away in the fused shadow relics, which were then each hidden within the aforementioned temples. Except for the one that Midna wears on her head. She just kind of has that one when we meet her, which she got at some point after being turned into an imp. We don't really know where she got it, maybe the interlopers took one with them when they were banished through the mirror into the Twilight Realm, but hey, at least it's conveniently the perfect fit for her imp-sized cranium. Anyway, the three fused shadows that were placed within the temples kind of ended up corrupting whatever life forms they came in contact with, which is what fused shadows do, according to Lineru, since they're essentially made of dark magic. The first boss in the game, Diababa, is actually just a Deku Baba. You know, one of these plants. These really annoying plants. It's clear from the giant Deku Baba heads and the name Baba in Diababa that it was indeed a corrupted Deku Baba. And now I've said Deku Baba too many times and it doesn't sound real. Moving on, Phyrus from the Goron Mines is actually the patriarch of the Gorons who had entered the mine in order to figure out why the volcano was acting so weird. Darbus apparently came into contact with the fused shadow once entering the volcano and boom, evil transformation. Fortunately, Link's many stabs from his sword didn't actually kill him, it just beat the evil out of him and he soon returned to normal right after, not remembering anything of the affair. The boss of the water temple, I mean the lake bed temple, Morpheal is once again a fused shadow corrupted eel which is evidenced by its eel-like appearance and the word eel in its name, Morpheal. And it's not super hard to believe that an eel was living underwater, so we'll call this one good. Next, let's move on to a very similar kind of boss in the game, those that were corrupted by the pieces of the Mirror of Twilight instead of the Fused Shadow, which happens after Zant destroys the mirror to preemptively prevent Midna from crossing over to the other side. Since he was only able to break it into four pieces, one of which remained on the mirror frame, he needed some place to hide them. So he pulled a Light Spirits move and hid each piece within a temple, or mansion on top of a mountain. And speaking of a mansion on top of the mountain, the Snow Peak Ruins is the location of the first boss, Blizzetta. Blizzetta is really just a little yeti lady named Yetta who lives alone with her husband appropriately named Yeto and who really likes her piece of the Mirror of Twilight. So much so that BAM it corrupts her and turns her into a monster, and may have even snapped her neck. Fortunately, you only really have to break the evil ice she builds up around her, leaving her body unscathed after the fight and fit for some husband and wife lovin'. Moving on, the next piece of the mirror is found in the distant past of the Temple of Time. It's curious as to how Zant was able to do this since the Door of Time doesn't open in the game until Link places the Master Sword in its pedestal once again, something Zant would not have been able to do, but that's another theory for another day. The boss of the Temple of Time is the Twilight Arachnid Armagoma, who is literally just a giant tarantula spider, meaning the Mirror Shard must have corrupted a tarantula spider in order to make Armagoma and sprout an evil eye on her back. And we know it's a her because she makes lots of babies. This boss definitely gets yeeted from existence though, and once sufficiently sent to the afterlife, as all spiders should be, procures the second mirror shard. The final shard can be found high in the sky, in the city in the sky, inhabited by the strange Uka race of little chicken people. Anyway, these little chicken people were being harassed by a dragon sent by Zant named Argorok, the Twilit Dragon, who Zant created by corrupting one of the regular Kargorok bird dinosaur enemies with the final shard of the mirror. I'm not sure if Zant meant for Argorok to immediately begin terrorizing the Uka people in the sky, or if he simply simply wanted to hide a shard in the most mobile form he could think of. But either way, Link and Midna are able to locate and kill the beastie and thus reclaim the final mirror shard. With the bosses made through both forms of Twilight Corruption out of the way, let's now shift our focus to the bosses that are just regular beings or monsters in the world of Hyrule, untainted by the corruption of Twilight. The first boss on this list is the caked up baboon named Ook, who was the very first mini boss of the game actually. Ook is the leader of the tribe of monkeys that live in the Faron Woods just outside Ordona, and is normally just a regular funny monkey guy until he got corrupted, but no, not by the Twilight. See, Ook somehow had a parasitic bug latch onto his forehead, which was the reason he started to go insane in the first place. This parasitic bug has designs that are similar to the Goats of Ordon, which my good buddy Lon Lon Historian astutely pointed out. So it's probably safe to say that this bug is actually a natural parasite that just so happened to latch onto Ook, maybe even while the Cake Master was sleeping. Either way, once properly spanked, Ook smashes into a nearby totem pole so 
hard that it knocks the parasite off of his head, which ends up dying immediately after detaching from its host. Kinda makes you feel bad for mercilessly destroying Ook's ass when you could've just knocked off the bug, huh? Anyway, next up we have the Goron guard named Dan Goro, or as I like to call him, Dan, who we meet in the Goron mines. Dan's just a good guy who's doing his job of protecting the sacred treasure hidden within the mines, which is, of course, the hero's bow. Dan isn't really the brightest, though, so instead of just asking why Link is there, Dan jumps straight to trying to murder him. Once you dump Dan into the lava a couple times, Dan listens to your reasons for being there and immediately goes back to being friendly and lets you pass. Just an ordinary Dan who jumped the gun a bit too early. Next up, we have the Deku Toad from the Lake Bed Temple, and honestly, this one is just as simple as it's wildlife of Hyrule that somehow made its home in the temple underneath Lake Hylia, and just so happened to move into the room that just so happened to have the claw shot inside it, which the toad just so happened to swallow. I highly doubt that there was some grand scheme from the makers of the temple for the hero to slice up a literal toad, or rather the toad's tongue, in order to regain the sacred claw shot from its stomach acids. Yeah, pretty sure this one's just an accident of nature. Anyway, weird vomiting amphibic enemies aside, next up we have the familiar Skull Kid from the Lost Woods, I mean the Sacred Grove. It's my opinion that this is the very same Skull Kid as the Skull Kid from Ocarina of Time in Majora's Mask because he knows Saria's song, which the Hero of Time taught to a particular Skull Kid hundreds of years ago. Plus, Skull Kids are immortal, so it's definitely possible. But, of course, it's also possible that it's just a different Skull Kid since there are an unknown number of them living in the woods and they could have just heard the song. The Skull Kid is a childlike forest spirit who loves games and mischief and who, in this case, forces Link to play with him before allowing Link access to the area deep within the woods where the Temple of Time and therefore the Master Sword rest. But he's not really a bad guy, he's just the fantasy version of it's a prank, bro! Next up is the Dark Hammer from the mysterious Snow Peak Ruins. Now, this is definitely one of the more obscure bosses in the game, but I personally subscribe to the notion that, since the Snow Peak Ruins itself has strong ties to the royal family of Hyrule, and since there are many cages and other Dark Hammer suits of armor present in the ruins, the Dark Hammer must be the result of some sort of experimental super soldier that the royal family was trying their best to procure. It's not like they haven't done some very similar, very shady, war tactic things in the past either, case in point being the Shadow Temple from Ocarina of Time, and they do also have some of their knights use the ball and chain weapon over in the Fallen timeline. Also, it does make sense that this Dark Hammer would simply be one of many due to the sheer number of giant three-fingered suits of armor present throughout the ruins. So adding this all together, it's my interpretation that the Dark Hammer that Link fights in the game is a fragment of the ruins' history, which is that there were experimental super soldiers created possibly from the Lizalfos or Dinalfos species and stored within the ruins, one of which was still alive and sprung to life when Link tried to pass through this storage room. But of course, this is all theoretical, and if you personally have a better theory that you'd rather believe, you are more than welcome to believe that instead. But I will say, if you're interested in the subject and you want to learn more, Zeltic has a very good theory video that sums up what I'm trying to talk about. I'll link to it in the description below. Moving on though, the next non-Twilight boss would be the very similar Dark Nut, which is another giant armor-clad enemy that's even more intelligent and even more humanoid than the Dark Hammer. Now, I have an entire in-depth theory on the Dark Nut enemies in general and how they link to both the Hero of Time and the Hero of Twilight, which I will link in the description below again if you are interested in a deeper dive into this concept. But, in a nutshell, it is again my interpretation that the Dark Nut Knights are none other than corrupted Knights of Hyrule. The biggest evidence being their physical placements and the clear Loftwing symbology on not only their Twilight Princess appearances, but also their Wind Waker appearance, where they're shown to flout out own Knight's Crests, which again features a prominent Loftwing symbol and heavily emphasizes a Knight. So yeah, in a nutshell, Dark Nuts are corrupted Knights of Hyrule, but for more info, check out my theory from 2020. Moving on, the next natural boss in the game is the Errol Foes, which simply put, is another sword and shield wielding humanoid lizard enemy, just like the Lizal Foes and Dinal Foes who are also similarly named, except the Errol Foes is airborne, with wings, making them more deadly and therefore more rare. And also like the Lizal Foes and Dinal Foes, the Errol Foes serves the forces of evil. It's a long-running theory that all of these lizard enemies are nothing more than the creations of Malice since they're shown to be made of Malice in Breath of the Wild, which would technically mean that they come from Demise and are actually demons, but that's a separate theory. For the purposes of this video, the Errol Foes is just another evil-serving lizard monster that seems to be guarding the second claw shot the first time we see it in the game, perhaps trying to prevent the hero from obtaining the necessary item to complete the City in the Sky dungeon and therefore claim the final mirror shard. And finally, it's time to talk about the most recurring boss in the game, King Bulblin, or as I like to call him, Zelda Shrek. This guy's existence and purpose is described by his name. He's the king of the Bulblin species of monsters, and he even explains why he and his people are so actively trying to kill you of their own volition. He follows the strongest side. Simply put, he must have witnessed the 
power of Zant at some point in the game and decided that for the health and well-being of he and his people, if he wanted to survive, he should probably be on Zant's side. But after witnessing Link in his powerful abs, decided to switch sides to the good side. Nobody likes a bandwagoner, but hey, at least he's honest. The bigger question here is where do the Bulblin species originate from in the first place, since they've rarely made appearances outside this game? But personally, I don't think this matters much, especially since they also make an appearance in the adult timeline in the game's spirit tracks. Meaning, they're out there in the world of Hyrule and beyond, we just don't see them very often. Some people believe that the Bulbans are none other than the evolved Gerudo women, but uh, yeah, no, I, I don't buy that personally. Especially because according to the encyclopedia, the Gerudo had actually moved further into the desert at this point, explaining their absence. The Bulbans must have just been another species of monster, just like Bacoblins, or Moblins, or Lynels, or, you know, all the other species of monsters in the series. Oh, and King Bulbans Mount also has a name, Lord Bulbo, Lord of all Bulbos, which are the giant pig monsters that Bulblins ride on. And that's about it. The last natural boss we'll discuss before moving on to the main character bosses is the one, the only, the Twilight Bloat. This gorgeous, elegant creature has many similarities to a queen termite, another gorgeous, Aww. elegant creature. Their beauty is beyond compare, and just like the termite, I believe the Twilight Bloat is the mother of all the shadow insects. Their queen, if you will, which were created by Zant in order to steal the light spirits' tears of twilight. What a beautiful animal species. Now with all the non-main character bosses out of the way, it's time to focus on the two that started it all. Zant and the big man Ganondorf himself. But let's start with Zant. Ant with a Z had a job before he usurped the Twilight Throne in the Twilight Royal Castle. He was a helper of the Twilight Royal family who served them because he believed that he would be the next appointed to rule. However, to his dismay, when it came time to choose the next leader, it was Midna who was chosen instead of Zant because people could see that he lusted for power and not much else. And she was then given the powers that only the ruler of the Twilight can possess. Now, it's unknown if the Twilight had a royal bloodline like the Hylian royal family has, which would imply that if Midna and Zant are both up for the crown that they would both be related, or if it's simply the matter of appointing the next monarch regardless of blood relation. Either way, Zant got a little perturbed at this since after all, he was patient and tried to wait his turn, and in his desperation, while he was literally throwing a temper tantrum on a balcony, he lifted his eyes and saw a god. And this god had a name, Ganondorf. Ganondorf vested part of his power, which is a mixture of dark Gerudo magic stemming from his mother twin Rova and that of the Triforce of Power in Zant, giving Zant much more power than that of the simple ruler of Twilight. With this new power, he cursed Midna to forever assume the imp-like form we see her in for the majority of the game, and then transformed all the remaining Twilight people into mindless beasts that only serve him, known as the Shadow Beasts. After taking care of any potential pushback from his fellow Twilight, he then set his sights on the world he wished to conquer, the Light World. With Ganondorf's power, he crossed over into Hyrule and then tasked King Bulblin to locate the Light Spirits in order to send Shadow Beasts to their locations to snuff them out, plunge the light into Twilight, and transfer the Light Spirits' tears of light to the Shadow Insects in one fell swoop. He then took the remaining Shadow Beasts and powerfully assaulted Hyrule Castle itself and was greeted with total surrender from the Hylian ruler, Princess Zelda. However, eventually Zant remembered that he has yet to possess the full power of the ruler of Twilight and tracks down Link and Midna of his own volition. He then asks Midna, who is the true ruler of Twilight, to join him, most likely implying that he would appreciate it if she would add her power to his. She refuses this because he's hella creepy, and then Zant proceeds to thrust her into the light world, which for a being of Twilight that can't exist in the light is probably something that felt kind of like a fish being forced to swim in lava. Of course, Zelda saves Midna's life by sacrificing her essence, and meanwhile, Zant heads off to the Arbiter's grounds to try to break apart the mirror and prevent the heroic duo from hunting him down. He even makes an appearance right before Link and Midna head up to the mirror chamber and revives an ancient stall enemy as a boss. Uh, oh, what's that? You notice I haven't covered Stallard yet? Keep watching, I'll get to him. Anyway, after which Zant proceeds to seemingly retreat back to the Twilight Castle in the Realm of Twilight, which ends up being the very place that he would meet his end. After piecing together the Mirror of Twilight, Link and Midna then enter the Twilight Realm and kill Zant once and for all, but not before he was able to confess to them the true origin of his powers, enter Ganondorf. Now, if you've been a Zelda fan for a while, or if you've watched my previous boss video, you know why Ganondorf rose to power and all the lore surrounding his reasons, so I'll skip over his origin story for now. However, I will explain what I think happened to him after Link was sent back in time at the end of Ocarina of Time. See, most people know that Ganondorf was captured and his plans were prevented, but there's a bit more to that story. Once Ganondorf was captured, he wasn't sentenced to death immediately. According to Aonuma, his execution at the Arbiter's Grounds happened several years after the events of Ocarina of Time 
time, since we can assume that Link warned Zelda and the Hylian royal family of Ganondorf's true intentions pretty much immediately following his being sent back in time, which would have directly led to Ganondorf's capture. This means that Ganondorf was most likely imprisoned for several years before his banishment. Where was he imprisoned, you ask? Why, at the Arbiter's Grounds, of course. Now, this is where things get interesting, because the Arbiter's Grounds was, according to Auru, or Aru, however you say his name, the site where the worst criminals in the land were held and executed, filling the grounds themselves with their malice. Now, Aru also says that the people who were sentenced to be executed were instead sent directly to the Underworld, aka the Realm of Twilight, via the Mirror of Twilight. But we can tell this is only half true because those who were banished were specifically only the ancient interlopers as described by Laneru. But that was a long, long time ago. There also just happens to be dead bodies and Poe's present everywhere within the Arbiter's grounds, implying pretty heavily that there were in fact inmates who were actually killed here as well, with their malicious souls haunting the hallways to this day. Enter one of the creepiest bosses in the game, the Deathblade. It's my simplistic personal interpretation that the Deathblade is literally the malice of the dead that Aru speaks of haunting the Arbiter's grounds, or at least some of it. As Lon Lon Historian and I were researching, the blade itself was most likely the execution blade that was responsible for taking countless lives of prisoners, leading to the blade itself itself being haunted by their combined evil essences. This also explains why the blade is being held down to the ground with ropes covered in what looks to be Ofura seals, which are used in several religions such as Shinto and Buddhism, which are present in Japan and believed to do several things, one of which is sealing spirits away. On the ground surrounding the blade is a giant summoning circle with runes drawn on the inside, and only when the ropes attaching the Ofura seals to the sword are severed, the death sword spirit is released, heavily implying that this room and the blade itself are meant to trap the souls of the most malicious dead inmates within. The goat-like spirit that materializes to control the sword is, in my opinion, the spirit that the sword was harboring, which is in and of itself another combination of Poe's spirits, like Bongo Bongo from Ocarina of Time. However, this was not the only way that inmates were executed in the Arbiter's Grounds. Have you ever thought it was weird that the entire Arbiter's Grounds setup is built as a coliseum? See, I think this plays into the reasons why Arbiter's Grounds has been condemned and people are now forbidden to even travel there. Because what's the point of a coliseum? Combat that normally ends in merciless, gruesome deaths for slaves or prisoners. What if the big, dark secret of the Arbiter's Grounds isn't just that there's a goddess-ordained banishing relic held there, or even that inmates used to be executed there, but that the worst prisoners, the ones who Hyrule hated the most, were sentenced to a gruesome death by combat against an insurmountable foe in the midst of the coliseum. Enter Star-Lord, the Twilight Fossil. Now again, just like several other bosses in this video, this is just my theory, and you're more than welcome to believe whichever one you want. Lots of fans of the series get caught up trying to figure out who Star-Lord is, as in whether or not Star-Lord is related to Volvagia, or perhaps King Dodongo from Ocarina of Time since they're dinosaurs and they all share the same boss fight theme. However, I personally feel that this line of thinking is impossible, because this is all assuming that Star-Lord is somehow younger than the aforementioned lizard bosses, simply because Twilight Princess takes place after Ocarina of Time when all signs point to the contrary. Since Aonuma states that Twilight Princess takes place somewhere between between 100 and 200 years after Ocarina of Time, and Arbiter's Grounds is clearly an ancient, run-down coliseum that alone implies age of potentially thousands of years, not one or two hundred. Given this and the sheer size of the colossal Star-Lord himself, and the fact that he was alive long enough to grow that big and then dead long enough to completely decompose, I'd wager that Star-Lord himself is as ancient if not more ancient than the Arbiter's Grounds Coliseum itself. Meaning, the question isn't really whether Star-Lord is or is a descendant of Volvagia or the Dodongos, but rather whether they are the descendants of Star-Lord. But aside from who Star-Lord is, isn't it strange that there's a giant monster placed right in the middle of an ancient desert coliseum? Isn't it possible that, given the nature of giant monsters and coliseums, and the fact that the Arbiter's Grounds was the location where many prisoners were killed, that Star-Lord himself was used as an execution method for whoever was in prison there? As in, Star-Lord was execution by combat? Think about it, why would Star-Lord be placed here, in the center of the grounds, directly underneath the mirror chamber. As a guard for the mirror? I heavily doubt that since Starlord was long dead before Zant's scimitar of Twilight brought him back to life. And how would Starlord have even gotten moved inside here in the first place? Perhaps the grounds were built for and around Starlord himself. Perhaps Starlord is the entire point of the Colosseum. And furthermore, what's with all the stall soldiers that Starlord can raise up from the sand at will? If you notice, they're all wearing armor, but it's very rudimentary and cheap looking and not at all like the armor of the soldiers of Hyrule, so it can be assumed that these non-Hylian soldiers were instead prisoners who were given cheap equipment to feign the hope that they could stand in combat against the terrifying 
Star Lord. And again, as a reminder, this has actually happened in human history. See the history of gladiators and the Colosseums. And Nintendo draws inspiration from history time and time again for the Zelda games. The point I'm trying to make though is that by the time Ganondorf was imprisoned here within the grounds, prisoners were actually being executed there either by way of the Death Sword quickly or by combat via Star Lord's Colosseum chamber. And this is also why the sages attempted to execute Ganondorf before resorting to banishing him, which is heavily implied with this cutscene to be something that they only do as an absolute last resort. So here is a neat little what if explanation theory for you. What if Ganondorf, who was imprisoned for years and sentenced to death, was sentenced to die at the hands of the monster Star Lord? And what if Ganondorf was actually the one prisoner who was able to kill him? Perhaps this is even why Ganondorf tells Zant to go resurrect Star Lord using Ganon's own power. He knew where Star Lord's corpse was because he was the one who made him a corpse. And this led to the sages taking matters into their own hands and freaking out a little bit since Ganondorf killed the big bad Star Lord and deciding to execute Ganondorf personally, or you know, at least attempting to. But as most people know, this was unsuccessful and Ganondorf was able to kill the Sage of the Water before ultimately being banished out of the Sage's desperation into the Twilight Realm, along with the very same Sword of the Sages that was meant to end his life. And once banished within the Twilight, Ganondorf... Ganondorf was left bodiness... Ganondorf was left bodiless but alive, and was able to rebuild and recharge his power while waiting over 100 years for a suitable host who would help him return to his beloved kingdom of Hyrule and finally claim the throne he so desperately desired. Once Zant was denied the crown and showed his true childish colors, Ganondorf saw the potential for Zant to be emotionally manipulated and housed part of his power within Zant, telling him not only to conquer the Twilight but to also conquer Hyrule within the Light World, so that he himself could return via Zant's new power after Hyrule has already fallen. And once Ganondorf was able to return to the light, he headed straight for the throne, sealing it off with a powerful Triforce-enabled barrier once he arrived, abandoning his disciple Zant to fall at the hands of the Twilight Princess. And this is where he awaited Link and Midna's arrival until the end of the game, when he and Link and Midna and Zelda wage an epic battle against one another that starts in the throne room and ends in Hyrule Field, where Link is finally able to best him in one-on-one -on -one combat using the skills passed down from the Hero Shade, who poetically was the first hero to face the Gerudo King, in order to end Ganondorf once and for all. And at the end of his life, when Ganondorf once again called upon the power of the Triforce of Power to save him from death as it did once before with the Sages, Zant strangely pops up on the screen and cracks his own neck to the side, which seemingly directly results in Ganondorf's actual final death. And for a much more in-depth explanation as to why Zant popped up here and how his neck crack possibly ended Ganondorf's life, check out the video I made on that exact topic. It'll be linked below along with all the other theories. A Zelda game without bosses is like a pizza with only cheese on it, which some people like, but where's the meat? Where's the olives? Where's the pineapple? Mamma mia! To start, let's cover the overworld bosses in the game, which admittedly count for like 107 of the 114 total bosses in Breath of the Wild, or a whopping 94%. The biggest number of overworld bosses comes from two types of giant monsters, the Hynex and the Stone Talus. Hynexes are actually recurring bosses in the Zelda franchise. You may recognize them from their previous iterations in A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, or a link between worlds. In every appearance, they're always giant cyclops-like enemies, although by far their biggest appearance size-wise has got to be in Breath of the Wild, where they appear to be, oh, at least 30 feet tall or so. Because Hynexes are present in other games just like Bacoblins or Moblins or Lizalfos or even Stalfos, it can be assumed that their origins are similar to any monster found across Hyrule, which either means that they're just a natural species of being that just so happens to be evil or that they were created by way of the Malice of Demise, which is a decent widely believed theory insinuating that all monsters across the world of Hyrule, or at least the organic ones, are made of malice, which originated from Demise. Should this be the case, then Hynaxes are no different and have simply been created by Calamity Ganon. And just like most of the other enemies throughout the game, their connection to Ganon's fiendish power according to the compendium is what results in their differing colors according to their individual power levels. A couple Hynaxes are actually dead and come back to life as the skeletal versions called Stalnoxes, which is of course due to the influence of Ganon's power and most most likely shares an explanation with all stall enemies spanning the entire franchise. The bigger question is why Ganon doesn't just make all of his monsters immortal like the stall monsters. You'd think that would be a pretty big brain move. Who knows, maybe his evil power can only go so far. Moving on, the stone talus bosses are quite literally living rocks that, you know, try to commit murder upon seeing Link. Because they're made of solid rock, they're extremely durable and take very little damage unless you attack a certain spot. And this spot appears to be their exposed brain or maybe even a heart on their central 
body piece, which normally looks like an ore deposit and is pretty much the only feasible way to kill one of these rocky dudes. They also seem to operate like a hub, where really their little brain deposit is the actual stone talus itself, and everything else just kind of sticks on or hovers around forming arms and legs due to magic. This enables them to mix and match other stone types into their body, allowing them to literally hurl their gigantic stone arms weighing multiple tons through the air in order to crush your tiny human skull, then just suck some more rocks out of the ground to create a new arm like nothing ever happened, or make their entire bodies out of molten rock or even frozen rock. Now, we could also just say that Ganon's power makes the stone talus monsters come to life, which is probably true either way, but there does appear to be some strange things going on with them and patterns that we can pick up on that would lead us to believe that there's more to this picture with regards to how they work. For instance, stone taluses appear to grow and mature over time. This is evidenced by the little bitty baby stone taluses called pebblets that you find throughout the land, followed by the stone talus junior and stone talus senior bosses. It could be that stone taluses are really just little nuclei that grow as minerals settle around them, leading to them growing or maturing over time, which is how rocks are formed in real life, so this explanation would be fitting. But the biggest question about these rock dudes is, where did that little nucleus come from? Is it a creation of Ganon's because he was just feeling artistic one day when he saw a rock? For a more thorough theory, check out this one I did about the possibility of stone taluses actually coming from outer space. I'll link to it below and be sure to bring your tin hat with you. With the Hinoxes and stone taluses out of the way, let's move on to the Molduga. This is the rarest kind of recurring boss in the game and again reanimates when Ganon's power surges under the light of a blood moon. So again, it could be assumed that Moldugas are simply creations of malice. On the other hand, creatures heavily resembling Moldugas can be seen throughout the franchise as well, like the Moldorms from Twilight Princess which also swim through the sand, or the Molgara boss from The Wind Waker, and yes, I will be doing a Wind Waker video soon so stay tuned. However, I would like to present one other possible explanation that ties the Malice theory into the wildlife of Breath of the Wild, and that would be that Moldugas could be Malice corrupted sand seals. It would make sense given the corruption that Malice is known for and the fact that Moldugas have horizontal tails, unlike all of the other worm-like mole enemies spread throughout the franchise. But of course, this is just my theory. The biggest Molduga is the Moldu King that shows up in Breath of the Wild's DLC, but to be honest, that's probably just a bigger sand seal. Moving on to the last world boss in the game, which the wiki doesn't count as a boss, but I absolutely do, enter the wonderful, peace-loving Lionel. That's a joke, these things are allergic to peace. Lionels have once again had other appearances in the franchise, first appearing in the first game actually, which means that the centaur-like Lionel as a concept in Zelda actually predates the Bokoblin, which is one of Zelda's most common enemies. In my opinion, Lionels have essentially the exact same backstory slash possible explanations as the Hynexes do. They are also biological monsters that could have either just been abound in the land of Hyrule or created purely out of malice. One thing that's notable about them though is their intelligence, which is rather high for a monster. Their weapons are forged from metal like the Lizalfos. They can see through disguises and they equip multiple different items like a bow and arrow and sword and shield or spear or large beat stick. The fact that they do forge weapons and there are many of them leads many fans to believe that there could be camps or communities of Lynels that survive together and share resources, which would only make sense given that other enemies in the game do the same thing. We never come across a Lynel camp in game, but perhaps we'll see some of these groups in Tears of the Kingdom, as terrifying as that would be. With the world bosses out of the way, it's time to move on to the unique bosses of the game aside from the final boss Calamity Ganon, and unfortunately there are only two, one of which is locked behind DLC, so really there's only one in the base game. Yeah, Breath of the Wild definitely could have capitalized on having more unique bosses, but anyway, let's start with the one in the base game. The strong, the burly, the one, the only, Master Koga himself, top banana of the Yiga clan. The Yiga clan, as most fans know, are defectors of the Sheikah clan, and as such are the same race of human beings, and feature the same white hair and red eyes as proven by the ex Yiga man we meet in game, Dorian. The Yiga clan has sworn off their sibling Sheikah clan and everything they stand for, which includes the Hylian royal family and the Hylian deities. Because of this, they actually serve Ganon instead and are both trying to hasten his resurrection and scouring the land in search of the hero Link, just in case he happens to still be alive a hundred years later. This command is said to have been given directly from their leader and is so ingrained in their brains that they actually carry out their sworn duty even when their leader is taken out of the picture. Koga himself has been alive for over 100 years, according to the Age of Calamity, and apparently is the de facto leader of the Yiga and in spite of his lazy napping nature is actually the earner of the utmost respect from them due to his mastery of secret combat techniques. He claims that his techniques come from his father's mother's father, which could possibly insinuate that his bloodline has ruled the Yiga clan for several generations, since the secret combat techniques that earn him his respect didn't originate from him, and that's about all we know about Koga. Anyway,
Anyway, moving on to the next unique boss in the game, Monk Maz Koshia. Maz Koshia is one of the well over 100 Sheikah monks in the game present within the shrines that were built over 10,000 years ago. The monks themselves appear to have committed a process known as Sokushin Butsu, which is the real life Buddhist art of self mummification that almost 20 Japanese Shingon monks actually managed to do between the years of 1081 and 1903. However, even a mummified human body can only take so many millennia, and as such, all of the monks in Breath of the Wild dissolve into dust after their shrines are completed. Well, all except for one. Maz Koshia is much more involved with Link than any of the other shrine monks, where each of them designed their own respective shrines and normally welcome Link and congratulate him upon completing their shrines, Maz Koshia actually orchestrates and guides Link telepathically through the entire Champion's Ballad questline which takes place all over Hyrule. Once Link finishes the many many steps to finding and completing the much larger final trial, Maz Koshia actually proves that these monks may have still been alive and that their voices weren't just echoes of the past or recordings, but that they were really talking to Link, and may have even been able to not only move a little, but move a lot. Maz Koshia actually stands up and straight up fights Link in what he refers to as the final trial within the final trial, which is probably one of the coolest moments in the game. It's unknown what Maz Koshia's relationship was to the other shrine monks, as in whether or not he was their leader or something, but he definitely was the greatest of them, and I personally like believing that the shrines and trials in general were all his idea, since he refers to his own as the final trial. A neat little piece of gameplay and lore that connects the Sheikah and Yiga together would be the fact that you can drop a banana on the ground for Maz Koshia and he will, uh, do this. Similarly, you can drop a banana on the ground for a Yiga soldier and they will act the same. Now, like I said before, they really are of the same race, so this banana obsession seems to run in the family, if you will. Maz Koshia's fighting styles are also interesting and allude to some in-universe lore as well, such as his ability to summon the extremely similar spiky balls that Koga does, implying that Koga's super secret combat technique is actually a Sheikah one, and that Maz Koshia might even be related to Koga, since the technique apparently runs in Koga's family. Plus, Koshia and Koga do actually sound pretty similar. Perhaps he even is Koga's father's mother's father. I mean, these Sheikah types do tend to live a long time. Maybe the bananas are the secret to long life. Anyway, Koshia can also duplicate himself, which is the exact same move that Impa can pull off in Age of Calamity, once again alluding to Sheikah combat prowess. Other than his moveset, trials, and potential relation to Koga though, there isn't much else to talk about regarding Monk Maz Koshia. So now, we'll move on and let his bones rest once and for all. The final boss slash boss as we're gonna cover in this video would be that of Calamity Ganon himself. I mean, itself, and all of its goons. For those who might be unfamiliar, Calamity Ganon is the latest iteration of Ganon, who originates from Ganondorf. More on him in my Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess and soon to be Windwalker boss videos though. It is said that by the time of Breath of the Wild, Ganon had been defeated and resurrected time after time after time again. So much so that his eventual return is something that can be relied upon prophetically. But why is he able to come back over and over? Where did Calamity Ganon even come from? From? Great question, and the answer is, in my opinion, from Demise. Now buckle up, because I'm going to explain to you my personal theory on the origins of Calamity Ganon, and Ganon in general, which could differ from your own. You are, of course, free to believe whichever you want, but check this out. Demise's essence is sealed within the Master Sword. This much is a fact proven by the ending of Skyward Sword. However, before he fades away, he promises that an incarnation of his hatred will forever follow the bloodline of Hylia and the spirit of the hero, all the while laughing his ass off and kind of having a jolly good time. Ask yourself though, what's so funny about losing a battle to a teeny tiny little insignificant human whelp? It's not like he was able to perform some ritual in order to bring this curse of his into life. And no offense, but that's kind of poor storytelling if he's able to literally curse the universe as we know it by simply thinking it up in his brain moments before literally being eradicated from existence. This franchise is a big fan of rituals and grandeur happenings that precede major events or changes in story. So if Demise, who was so cocky that he would win 20 minutes ago, gets his ass handed to him and is then unable to perform a curse on Hylia, then why is he laughing? Well, I'll tell you what I think. I think Demise had already cursed the world with his malice. Think about it, he was sealed away in the giant imprisoned avocado form many years ago by Hylia herself, yet monsters still plague the surface of early era Hyrule, and these monsters just so happened to be created by malice. So clearly, Demise must have released his malice into the world before he was ever imprisoned, possibly back in the age where he and Hylia battled directly. And you know what Calamity Ganon is made of? 
malice in its purest form, the culmination of all of Demise's hatred unleashed upon the universe in order to be a scourge upon Hylia's bloodline, epitomized into the mindless, formless monster known as Calamity Ganon. But I hear you wondering aloud, but Bandit, how did Ganondorf turn into Ganon if Calamity Ganon comes from Malice which is separate from Ganondorf? Well, I'll tell ya. It's because I believe that Calamity Ganon and regular Ganon are two different monsters. That's right, you heard me. Two different things. And for proof of this, let's look at the origin of Ganon canonically. He was created at this moment at the end of Ocarina of Time, when Ganondorf moments from death calls upon the power of the Triforce of Power to transform into a hideous, power-hungry pig beast, which is then killed by Link and is never seen again. But Bandit, I hear you wondering aloud once more, Ganon comes back in other games. I yes, yes he does. But as different Ganons each time. Except for the Ganon in the Link to the Past and onward. In this timeline, he just remains the same walking on two legs version of Ganon since the Fallen timeline only happens if Ganon kills Link here at the end. But in Twilight Princess, Ganondorf once again transforms into a Ganon, referred to as Dark Beast Ganon, who is a four-legged version created via the power of the Twilight, and is then killed by Link and Midna, never to be seen again. In Wind Waker, since Ganondorf retained the Triforce of Power following his defeat at the hands of the Hero of Time, but since Ganon had been killed previously in Ocarina of Time, he instead infuses a giant freaky transforming puppet with his power and calls it Puppet Ganon. Now, there are other appearances of Ganon in the Fallen timeline, but I won't take the time to go over each of them now. My point is that what if Ganon is the monster that Ganondorf creates when infused with a large external source of power, be it the Triforce, the Twilight, or Malice? See, it's my opinion that due to seeing Ganondorf's corpse spewing Malice from within in the Tears of the Kingdom trailers, Calamity Ganon is the culmination of Demise's leftover Malice that has gotten a hold of Ganondorf and used his body over and over and over again over the countless millennia to create many different Calamity Ganons, some of which even took different forms. And what's more is that perhaps the Malice appearing in Tears of the Kingdom right around the Ganondorf corpse is more tendril-like and thick and deeply red in color because it's bonded with Ganondorf's blood, which resulted in his drained appearance. Now, the other versions of Calamity Ganon called the Blight Ganons, which each take on the abilities and moves of the champions they were responsible for killing 100 years ago, are simply extensions of Calamity Ganon itself, since it's just made of Malice anyway, and we know that Malice can clearly split apart as much as it wants to across Hyrule, and can even create other monsters given that it has bodies to corrupt, and therefore create other Ganons should it have a body like Ganondorf's that's powerful enough to corrupt. And wouldn't you know it, we can't find the champion's bodies anywhere in the game, and their Blight Ganons each move just like they do. But for a much deeper dive into what I'm insinuating here, check out my video that I did on that exact topic linked below. And that wraps up the complete 3D Zelda boss lore video series. Thank you all so much for being here and watching these videos and contributing to the continued success of the channel. I wouldn't continue making these videos if it wasn't for you guys. Once again, please consider liking the video if you enjoyed it, or at least my efforts into making it all, and subscribe if you haven't already for much, much more. Huge thanks as always to my Bandit crew, who continually go above and beyond in support of the channel, and a very warm welcome to Joy H, who just joined up. That's all for this one, so be sure to follow me on my socials, and I'll see you next time. This is Bandit, signing out. Peace!